Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. This Wednesday, November 1st, I'm Julie Hyman. That's Josh Lipton. We're here at the New York Stock Exchange, and we are moments away from the Fed's decision on interest rates. Wall Street is widely expecting the Fed to hold rates steady. Uh, they're already at the highest levels in 22 years ahead of the Fed rate decision. If we take a look at stocks right now, uh, we do have them in the green uh, across the board. Not seeing big increases here, but the Nasdaq leading the way as we have seen rates come down today. The Nasdaq up about two thirds of one percent, the S&P up four tenths of one percent and the Dow up about a quarter of one percent. As we await the Fed decision, uh, Josh, uh, it's very interesting here how little expectation there is for yeah. any kind of change today. Not a lot of drama expected, not a lot of fireworks. I mean, that's expectation. We'll see what happens. We did, though, I mean, we did just hear from Jay Powell mm -hmm. a few weeks ago. I mean, it wasn't that long ago, so it's hard to imagine his thinking has changed that much and that he'd want to shock the market, give a surprise. He did remember talk a lot about Julie the tightening of financial conditions he was seeing as these, given the rise in rates. The money quote a lot of people focused on at that point was given the fast pace of tightening, there may still be meaningful tightening in the pipeline, he said. I think that, coupled with a lot of the talk we heard from other central bankers, led a lot of people to believe, listen, they're going to take a breather for right now. Yes, and as we know and as we've heard from various guests, Jay Powell does not like to surprise the market. So therefore, no surprises are expected for today. There's also been a lot of discussion about the uh, yield curve and yields in general doing the work of the Fed for yep. sort of causing tightening in the system. And as you and I have talked a lot about, and as you said, this tightening is still in the pipeline. In other words, it has these lagged and variable effects. So the Fed is giving those effects a little bit of time to work their way through the system to see what they end up doing to inflation and to the economy before there's any move. And now we're going to toss it to our Jen Schoenberger in Washington. No change. The Federal Reserve holding interest rates steady in the range of five and a quarter to five and a half percent, but leaving the door open to the possibility of future rate hikes. Fed officials upgrading their assessment of the economy to strong in the third quarter. That's up from a solid pace noted in the September statement, of course, is coming in the wake of sizzling third quarter GDP and strong consumer spending. They say job gains have, quote, moderated versus slowed from earlier in the year in the September statement. So a bit of an upgrade there to the job market as well. The Fed reiterated that future rate hikes will be contingent upon the impact of previous rate hikes, lag effects, as well as economic developments. Fed officials maintained language in their statement to keep the door open for rate hikes, saying that, quote, in determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate, the committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation, at economic and financial developments. Fed officials reiterated that they are highly attentive to inflation risks and still see inflation as, quote, elevated. This decision was unanimous. We will get more from Fed Chair Powell in less than 30 minutes' time when he holds his press conference. Back to you. So, Jennifer, now all eyes turn to that presser. What do you expect to hear from Jerome Powell? Yeah, I think, Josh, he's going to reiterate basically what he said on October 19th ahead of coming into this meeting. He's got to walk that tightrope of remaining cautious because the Fed has already done so much work. They don't want to plunge the economy into recession. But at the same time, we're continuing to see really resilient economic data. And so Fed Chair Pell said and added the caveat that if the economy and the job market continue to outperform, then that could, using his language, mean more work to do, more rate hikes in the future. And I really think that you're going to see the Fed Chair continue with that line here in the press conference. I think there's going to be a lot of questions as well uh, on how how much the bond market is doing the Fed's work for it. And I think that is going to be uh, contingent upon how long these yields on the 10-year Treasury can be sustained. And certainly we've seen that back off a bit from the highs of 5%. Jennifer Schomberger, thank you so much. Appreciate it. I continue to watch what's going on in the markets here, and we do have stocks uh, hanging on to gains. I'm also looking at the bond market on the Yahoo Finance Interactive here, looking at Treasury futures and seeing the prices there move up, which indicates that we are still seeing declines in yields. There's the 10-year U.S. Treasury note futures and the two-year. And witness on the right side of your screen here that leg up, that candlestick up. Our Jared Blickery loves those candlesticks. That candlestick up there. So 
In other words, on the intraday basis, seeing prices go up and yields come down. This is uh, at least at the first blush being seen as a somewhat hawkish statement, even though, Josh Lipton, it's what the Fed has been telegraphing for weeks, what Jay Powell himself has been telegraphing, yeah. that there wasn't going to be a change. Yeah, I mean, this was very well telegraphed that we heard from any number of central bankers that, listen, we've done a lot. We've done a lot very quickly, very fast, and maybe it's time here to take a brother, take a pause, see what kind of effect this has. A couple points, though. One is this sort of general assessment they have of the economy. Uh, the post-meeting statement indicated economic activity expanded at a strong pace in the third quarter. We know that. Um, I think the question becomes, of course, what's ahead? A lot of attention here on the presser. Some things I'm going to be interested in hearing about is, one, as we discussed, Julie, those rising yields. How does Jay Powell think about that? What kind of impact does he think that has on the economy, the consumer, and businesses? And, of course, also, how does he think about inflation right now, where it is, and how does he see the trajectory from here? What are just the puts and takes, the variables he's thinking about? You know, the debate has really been, is the Fed too backward-looking here? Is it being too reactive to things that are in the rearview mirror and not looking ahead enough? Or... Has it already, you know, maybe it's already been too aggressive, right, in its tightening and the effect on the U.S. economy effects that we've not yet seen. So, or maybe those are the same thing. I don't know. In other words, you know, there, there is this um, question of whether people believe the Fed is looking at the right data sense to make its decisions. All right. Well, let's get two very smart guests to help us on that. For more on the Fed's decision, let's bring in Greg Daco, EY chief economist also with us, is Bob Elliott co-founder and CEO of Unlimited. So, uh, Greg, let me start with you. Just give me your take on the news. Is it what you expected? Yeah, largely what we expected. The Fed is on hold. We think the Fed is likely to remain on hold for the foreseeable future, and the next rate move will likely be a cut, but not before the middle of 2024. I think one of the key elements in the statement is the fact that they noted that tighter financial conditions are also going to weigh on economic activity and eventually on inflation. That aligns with this narrative that some of the tightening in financial conditions is doing some of the Fed's job in maintaining this tight monetary policy stance. So we'll hear more from Fed Chair Powell as to forward guidance going into the end of the year. They'll want to maintain that optionality of potentially further tightening down the road if needed. But for now, the Fed is on hold. Hey, Bob, it's Julie here. So how much tightening have we seen, right? What, even though some of the effects are not really on the surface, has the Fed done enough? Well, I think the main question is take a look at what's happening with economic conditions. And I think it was really important what we saw in the statement was uh, a, a, an emphasis of the word strong, strong growth. And so if you were just looking at the economic outcomes, we had 8% nominal GDP growth in the third quarter. We have 5% real growth. We have wages growing in the most recent ECI report of about 5% nominal. This is all, these are all indicators of very strong economic activity. And yet, what it looks like is the Fed is more focused on the possibility of a forward-looking financial-oriented tightening than they are looking at the data that's in front of them. Because if they were just looking at the data in front of them, what they the decision would be relatively clear, and that would be to tighten interest rates, given just how strong the economy is and how low unemployment is in the, in the economy right now. But they're focused on the financial conditions, and in the same way in which they were very cautious coming out of SVB, they continue to be very cautious anytime there's even a modest financial hiccup in the system. All things considered, 10% on stocks and 100 basis points on bonds aren't that big a deal in the context of the overall economy. And Greg, let me get your take on this question of lags. I was, you know, I've talked a lot about it with Julie and the guests and this, this time difference between when you hike the rates, Greg, and its actual impact on the economy. And there's great debate about that, short or long. How do you think about that dynamic, Greg? Are we, are we just in, at the start of seeing the effects of this rate hiking campaign? Well, I think, you know, we're in an environment where there's no doubt the economy remains robust. If you compare the economy across the world, the U.S. economy remains uh, the one that looks the best. We did see strong growth over the summer. We did see consumer spending. We do have an environment where there is still that inflationary pressure. But if you look ahead, and I think that needs to be the Fed's key focus going forward, is if you look ahead at the expectations for the labor market, we're seeing a slowdown and moderation in job growth. 
we're going to see more easing in inflationary dynamics, moving back below, I would think, the Fed's own expectations for both headline and core PCE going into the end of this year. And we are going to see a slowdown that is disinflationary. I think these are really the conditions that the Fed should focus on when it guides monetary policy going into next year. It's not so much about the backward-looking data-dependent approach as much as it is about a forward-looking approach that incorporates likely developments on the economic front as well as financial market developments. And Greg, you've been pretty outspoken on this, that the Fed is too backward looking here. I mean, to sort of take the other side of that and something we've heard from some economists, does 25 basis points more matter that much one way or the other? Well, I think you can frame that question in the right way, because uh, when you say, does it matter one way or the other, not in the immediate future, but it does have an effect on financial conditions. So if the Fed were to surprise markets with additional tightening or less tightening relative to its expectations, that could have big consequences in terms of the financial market implications, long-term yields, equity prices, volatility, that would then affect business decisions. I think what's key here is that the Fed had a playbook in the first half of the game. They were behind on, in terms of inflation. They tightened very aggressively, almost at all costs. Now the game is very different. We're seeing balanced risks of over-tightening and under-tightening, and that requires a more nimble approach in terms of policymaking, factoring the possibility that there could still be a fumble and that we want to aim for soft landing. So not tightening too much is the right decision at this time, and it's really about watching where the economy is headed and whether and how resilient the economy is going to be and how inflationary the growth prospects are actually going to be. And Bob, so now all attention, of course, today, it turns to Jerome Powell and that presser. What are you going to be listening for there? I think the main question continues to be, what is the reaction function? And I think that that ambiguity about the reaction function has been the challenge that most have had in the markets, you know, over the course of the last really year or so. Um, what it looks like based upon the statement, is that the emphasis is going to be around those risks, those risks, those financial market risks, much more so than the risks that every day the inflation remains elevated, there's an increasing risk that it becomes entrenched. And to be clear, that's very normal. Early in a longer term inflationary cycle, most central bankers uh, are typically quite hesitant to meaningfully tighten in the, in the face of inflation, of elevated inflation pressure because the risks of t tightening too much are relatively known and concerning, and the risk of not tightening enough are basically things that play out for an extended period of time. But odds are, if the Fed continues to take this extremely cautious path, we and inflation continues to be elevated over time, and we continue to have it seep in and get more entrenched in the economy, the bigger mistake the Fed will be thought of as making during this period is not getting too, too started too late. But it's going to be much more about the fact that they stopped hiking too early. And that's the real risk for the Fed, that they'll have to do a whole heck of a lot more a year from now, let's say, because they've been too hesitant today because they're concerned about financial risks. Bob, I got to tell you, it feels like you're in the minority here, uh, given at least compared with most of the folks we talk to, right? Most of the people we talk to warn more of a policy mistake here from over tightening, breaking something in the system is something we've heard from the likes of Mohammed El Arian and others. I think Greg is probably somewhat on the same page here that you, you know, we saw a little hint of it, right, with the regional banking crisis, but it didn't blossom into something more. How, aren't you worried about that kind of a risk as well? I think the question uh, from the Fed's perspective, which is, what they're trying to do, what their mandate is, is to preserve the highest quality medium term growth by balancing both uh, employment and price stability. And when it comes to medium, the thing that determines medium term growth is productivity. And the thing that determines productivity is this is price stability more than pretty much anything. And so I think there are a lot of people out here talking uh, based upon their life, their life experience of a secular disinflationary environment where we're being responsive to growth was the prudent 
uh, strategy because there was no cost to not being responsive to, to inflationary pressures. They didn't have to worry about inflation. But we're in a different environment. The world of 40 years of secular disinflation is over. We're moving in the opposite direction. And what we're seeing is across both the Treasury and the Fed, a set of dovish responses that, if continued, will put us on a path to a longer-term, higher inflationary environment. And so it's true. We've got to call up experiences like that of the 60s, where we had expansionary deficits and monetary policy that was too easy, that set the stage for the inflationary 70s. Those are the experiences that are most pertinent, not people's experiences and views drawn from you know, decades of disinflation and peace. Greg, what do you think? I think that's absolutely right. We are in a very different uh, landscape when it comes to inflationary dynamics. That being said, we're also in an environment where monetary policy is currently quite restrictive. That is implying downward pressure in terms of economic activity, and it's leading to more disinflation, actually more disinflation than the Fed had expected. If we look just at the September economic projections, the Fed has core inflation uh, ending the year around 3.7%, uh, uh, headline inflation around 3.3%. It looks like the forecast, the actual data, will come in below that, likely around 3.2 percent um, and uh, probably around 3.5 percent for um, core inflation. So we're looking at a, a forecast in terms of economic data that will be forthcoming that's likely to undershoot the Fed's own inflation expectations. So yes, there are structural forces that will likely put upward pressure on inflation over the medium term. But I think if you look at the next 12 months, we're in an environment where tight monetary policy is having the desired effect on economic activity and on inflation, and we're moving in the right direction. So that further monetary policy at this point, tightening is not necessary, and we need to really be in this holding pattern focused on the effects of this tightening on economic activity with a lag, as well as on financial conditions. We got a little debate going here. Bob, um, lastly, just very quickly here for investors, for the next six months, what is the most important thing strategically that investors should keep in mind? Well, I think, frankly, the biggest thing that they should keep in mind is uh, is looking towards towards balance, more balance in terms of their portfolio. You know, uh, the typical 60-40 portfolio is all in on disinflation and strong growth. That may occur, but there are uh, a lot of circumstances. You know, if you look across markets, basically markets are priced in all in on a soft landing environment occurring. And there's lots of different ways in which that won't occur, whether inflation ends up being a little more elevated and that benefits diversified commodities, uh, whether growth ends up being slower than expected, which benefits bonds uh, at the expense of stocks, or whether, frankly, there's increased conflict relative to people's expectations which could particularly benefit gold. And so I think in a lot of ways, the traditional 60-40 positioning here is uh, one of the, the lowest, uh, the lowest uh, probability portfolios that are out there. And so most folks have to look for other assets and other positions that are going to put them uh, into a situation where they can absorb a wider range of outcomes than currently priced in. Greg Daco and Bob Elliott, thank you both guys so much for joining us today. Thank you. Now let's take a look at how markets reacting to this news. Yahoo Finance's own Jared Blickery is here with that. Jared. Thank you, Josh. Let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive where we are seeing very little reaction in the, in the markets, especially equities. Let me start with the Dow. This is today's price action. And here's what happened at 2 p.m. Eastern. A little up, a little down. We are net down from the announcement, but still positive on the day. And I should emphasize, these are tiny, tiny moves that we're seeing. You can see the S&P 500, some more movement in there and also down from the announcement. And then the NASDAQ, that is off a little bit as well. Now let's take a look at the bond market. Uh, Julia was taking a, a look at two-year Treasury note futures before, and indeed they have uh, spiked up on this just a little. That means their yield is decreasing. And uh, let's check out the 10-year as well. Also a little bit of upwards movement there, but not quite as much. It means the yield has dropped. And then I was looking at gold. We saw a little bit of a reaction in gold. I'm going to change into candles, uh, candlesticks here, but we're basically back where we left off. So I'm expecting some fireworks at 2.30, but definitely not right now, guys. 
All right, not yet. We'll see if it happens. Jared, thank you. Let's talk more about what we have so far. That is the Fed's uh, no change in terms of rates and also the statement. Here with more is Andrew Levin, former Federal Reserve Board Special Advisor and Dartmouth Economics Professor. Andrew, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate uh, your time as we look at this statement and try to figure out what to make of it here. Um, one of the interesting things that you've written about recently is the unanimous nature of the Fed typically here. Um, at a time like this, we just heard the debate, right, that we got a little bit between Bob and Greg. Why isn't there more debate at the Fed? And what do you think is being lost as a result of that? Yeah, I think it's a, I think the Fed is making a big mistake. Um, there are some super talented people now at the Fed on the board and among the regional uh, presidents. The problem the Fed should be aware of is that the Fed's going to be in the presidential election next year. Um, and um, they, they don't they don't like to be in that position. But if inflation is running high, um, if the if the Fed is um, <laughs> kind of shrugging its shoulders, it's not sure what to do. Um, that's just not a good situation. That could have long term adverse consequences for the Fed. So the, the problem isn't just that they're being short sighted about the inflation. I, the Fed needs to be a team of physicians with some real open debate and discussion. These are tough issues. The right way forward. Um, and um, the public needs to have confidence that these decisions are really being taken seriously. Now, just one example. So you said to Bob, well, he's kind of in the minority. First of all, the Fed's been consistently wrong for several years, and we heard that very powerfully this week. Um, and secondly, um, Bill Dudley, who's a former president of the New York Fed, this morning wrote an op where he said he thinks the Fed is missing the boat. So how could it be that people outside the Fed have um, some pretty strong, diverse views, and we're not seeing it today. This was a unanimous decision again. Um, but just no sense of real debate going on. And do you, do you expect that to change, Andrew? I, I think for it to change, um, the chair, that the chair is the most powerful person at the Fed. Um, and we've had had uh, prior chairs who, uh, Ben Bernanke was one, who really encouraged debate um, was within mind if, if people had dissenting votes. Um, the approach that the Fed's taking right now is much more more like a corporate board. Um, we um, all speak with one voice. Um, if, if anyone has any discomfort, they, uh, it's not supposed to be revealed in public. Um, we know that that's not the right way for a, a, a really good committee to make decisions. Um, we know the Supreme Court has difficult decisions to make, and sometimes they're 5-4 or 6-3 or 7-2, and we may not agree with their decision, but at least uh, the public can know that those are really serious debates, and that's what should be happening at the Federal Reserve. Andrew, what is the biggest risk, then, um, of that sort of lack of debate, specifically for this Fed and for this moment in time? Is it that they're not aggressive enough and they don't continue to raise interest rates? Or is it that maybe they've already raised so, too far? I mean, what do you think? Okay, I would say the biggest risk that they're making right now is they talk about taking a meeting by meeting approach. And that's just not the right way to make monetary policy. Monetary policy has, you have to have a strategy. You have to explain to people where we're heading. Again, like physicians, um, there's a, there's there's a, a bunch of different um, tests that come in. The, the physicians, a team of doctors, a difficult case, um, are are uh, discussing diagnosis, prognosis, what's the treatment. If that treatment doesn't work, what's next after that? Um, if if Chair Powell today would talk about the risk that inflation does end up being twice their target, which is my expectation actually, that's where things are running. Um, that twice their target. What more are they ready to do? Um, so the, the explain to the patient, the patient's family, um, you know, what kind of treatment might be necessary. And sometimes it's painful in the short run, but um, there's longer run benefit. You want the patient to get back to full health. Um, inflation is terrible for, especially for ordinary working people and, and families and retirees. So we don't want that to be a long run chronic problem. We, we need to figure out a way to, to get back to uh, price stability. 
And, and I'm going to get you out of here on that, Andrew. This this question of inflation, obviously, at the press are coming up. There's going to be a lot of attention paid to Jerome Powell, the trajectory of inflation he sees still well above his target. Where do you see the trajectory of inflation from here, Andrew? And what are just the puts and takes, the variables to that? Well, I'm a pro worker. I think it's great that workers are starting to get more cost of living increase. That's what we saw this week with United Auto Workers. Okay, they're, they're getting, well, as far as I can tell, six or seven percent pay increases per year over the next several years. A lot of workers would like to get a five, six, seven percent pay increase. So there's been a big cost of living increase, but the challenge that creates for the Fed is we're now in a um, what, what I would call a very entrenched situation with inflation running in the range of four to five percent. Um, what's the Fed's plan to bring it back down um, to get back to a low stable inflation of around two? That's the that's the urgent question for the Fed to to explain for Chair Powell to explain at the, at the press conference today. All right, we will all be listening. Andrew Levin, thank you so much for joining us. The Federal Reserve decided to hold rates steady. Meanwhile, U.S. Treasury Department says it will slow the pace of increases in its longer dated debt auctions. So where does this leave the future path for Treasury yields? Here to discuss, we have Luis Alvarado, Wells Fargo Investment Institute, Global Fixed Income Strategist, along with Ella Hoda, Newton Investment Management Head of Fixed Income. So Luis, let me just start with you and get your reaction to the news we have so far from the Fed. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. As expected, the Fed decided to maintain its policy rate on hold. I don't think the Fed really came out to shock the markets. They are really waiting and wanting to proceed cautiously. Obviously, uh, in the statement, as it was uh, described, financial conditions have tightened in the economy, and they want to proceed cautiously. Um, Ella, um what do you want to hear from this press conference? I mean, we know we, we didn't get much from the statement, right? There was no change. Not sure exactly what's going to happen in December. What do you think is the most important question for Jay Powell going into this press conference? Well, um, clearly the the view on the economy and wages, right? So um, the the labor market has been uh, a little bit softer, but we're coming from very strong levels. And, uh, you know, in terms of the cycle, the economy itself, uh, we've also seen a few data points that are saying things are softening. But we're, again, coming from a very high nominal level. Uh, so it's very early days that yet, you know, to say whether they're uh, completely done with regards to the, the hiking path. So um, I think he's probably going to want to buy some um, space to allow the Fed to be able to re-engage should the weakness in the cycle be less than uh, what has been anticipated. And Luis, just also to you on, on that question, what, what do you think um, is the rate hiking campaign from here? There's any number of economists and strategists we've had on who think, listen, they're done. Um, they can hold here. Is that your sense? Or do you think, no, perhaps the market is wrong here and there could be another hike in the pipeline? Yeah, definitely. We are definitely on, on more hikes potentially on the pipeline. Um, definitely inflation is a big threat. We're coming from a strong third quarter, uh, strong unemployment still. Definitely behind, underneath the surface, you're starting to see some things slow down, but that's not enough ammunition for the Fed to really come back and say the job and inflation is done. Actually, inflation is tricky, and they have the playbook going back to the 70s and 80s where you see inflation coming down but then staying sticky, and then what happened in the 70s is that it climbed back again. So they are afraid they're going to get the pedal off too soon, and obviously Chair Powell and the rest of the committee want to make sure that they really hammer this on inflation. So in our views, there's definitely more potential rate hikes, especially if we continue to see this strong economy on unemployment le levels that are still fairly low. And um, we still believe that there's probably another rate hike for December. That could be 50-50. There's going to be a lot of incoming data coming in. But if we continue to see all this sort of benign um, incoming data, then we don't, we're not discounting the fact that we could see more rates potentially in, um, in January and then in March in 2024. Um, so I have a question then for both of you. And Ella, I'll ask you first. Have we seen the peak in yields here as a result of federal interest rate policy. And obviously it matters what the Fed is going to do from here. But is 5% the peak in the 10-year, for example? 
Um, it's very, it's a very difficult question to answer, and, and I think it's because uh, the bond market has been so tempted to say, "This is it. Surely we're there yet, and we've reached this magical five percent." And you know, what's so special about five percent, right? Um, so, look, I mean, as you approach cash levels uh, in terms of Treasury yields, uh, which we've done, so we've made good progress on that over the last um, few months. Um, you can argue that there's some value in bonds, right? So you could argue that the asymmetry particularly in Treasury, starts to look interesting. So if you look at 10-year yields, uh, there's more ways to make money than lose money. And even if yields don't change, you can at least start to match your cash returns, more or less. Like, you know, you're close to doing that. So that's what's interesting for us as investors. So you can start to, to own exposure there. Are we done yet? I mean, a lot of investors have been trying to catch a falling knife. You've been looking at the price action on uh, TLT, you know, the, the large, famous ETF. Uh, that's been telling you that, uh, you know, until that flow is potentially uh, close to capitulation, that you probably are not potentially done yet with a sell-off. So you can accumulate exposure here, assuming that we might be close to the end of uh, the hikes and the end of uh, bond yield rises. But I wouldn't be sure. I wouldn't be staking my house on that. And it is a difficult call. Luis, though, what, what do you think on this point? Yeah, definitely. From our point of view, we still believe that there's still upside pressure for yields from this point on. Obviously, there are a lot of you know uh, fiscal problems that are still roaming around. Uh, we also believe that um, a lot of pressure from the issuance that is going to happen from the Treasury. So technicals, like that supply demand, we're starting to see also some of those buy buyers, foreign buyers, like, China and Japan stepping out. So that's going to keep technicals pretty pretty much tight in there because of this extra supply coming into the market, not a lot of demand. On the other hand, until the Fed decides to kind of pivot and move towards maybe holding more openly and even cutting, we still believe that there's still more pressure for the yield curve in the near term. Now, what is going to be a deciding factor, of course, is if we do have that economic slowdown or recession into 2024, and if this financial condition is, the conditions tightening, which is what uh, the statement kind of alluded to, it starts taking a toll on the economy, we could see longer term yields starting to decline ahead of the Fed, uh, where the market is eventually expecting some rate cuts to happen, some part in the second half. That is going to give us that shape of the curve that is ideal for fixed income strategies like myself, right. where we have this sort of bear. OK, bear, Luis. Um, Luis and Ella, thanks so much. We're going to listen into Jay Powell. My colleagues and I remain squarely focused on our dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. We understand the hardship that high inflation is causing, and we remain strongly committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2 percent goal. Price stability is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve. Without price stability, the economy does not work for anyone. In particular, without price stability, we will not achieve a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. Since early last year, the FOMC has significantly tightened the stance of monetary policy. We have raised our policy interest rate by five and a quarter percentage points and have continued to reduce our securities holdings at a brisk pace. The stance of policy is restrictive, meaning that tight policy is putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation and the full effects of our tightening have yet to be felt. Today, we decided to leave our policy interest rate unchanged and to continue to reduce our securities holdings. Given how far we have come, along with the uncertainties and risks we face, the committee is proceeding carefully. We will make decisions about the extent of additional policy firming and how long policy will remain restrictive based on the totality of the incoming data, the evolving outlook, and the balance of risks. I'll have more to say about monetary policy after briefly reviewing economic developments. Recent indicators suggest that economic activity has been expanding at a strong pace and well above earlier expectations. In the third quarter, real GDP is estimated to have risen an outsized annual rate of 4.9 percent, boosted by a surge in consumer spending. After picking up somewhat, over the summer, activity in the housing sector has flattened out and remains well below levels of a year ago, largely reflecting higher mortgage rates. Higher interest rates also appear to be weighing on business fixed investment. The labor market remains tight, but supply and demand conditions continue to come into better balance. 
Over the past three months, payroll job gains averaged 266,000 jobs per month, a strong pace that is nevertheless below that seen earlier in the year. The unemployment rate remains low at 3.8 percent. Strong job creation has been accompanied by an increase in the supply of workers. The labor force participation rate has moved up since late last year, particularly for individuals aged 25 to 54 years, and immigration has rebounded to pre-pandemic levels. Nominal wage growth has shown some signs of easing, and job vacancies have declined so far this year. Although, although the jobs to workers gap has narrowed, labor demand still exceeds the supply of available workers. Inflation remains well above our longer run goal of 2 percent. Total PCE prices rose 3.4 percent over the 12 months ending in September. Excluding the volatile food and energy categories, core PCE prices rose 3.7 percent. Inflation has moderated since the middle of last year, and readings over the summer were quite favorable. But a few months of good data are only the beginning of what it will take to build confidence that inflation is moving down sustainably toward our goal. The process of getting inflation sustainably down to 2 percent has a long way to go. Despite elevated inflation, longer-term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored, as reflected in a broad range of surveys of households, businesses, and forecasters, as well as measures from financial markets. The Fed's monetary policy actions are guided by our mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices for the American people. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that high inflation imposes significant hardship as it erodes purchasing power, especially for those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials like food, housing, and transportation. We are highly attentive to the risks that high inflation poses to both sides of our mandate, and we are strongly committed to returning inflation to our 2 percent objective. As I noted earlier, since early last year, we have raised our policy rate by five and a quarter percentage points, and we have decreased our securities holdings by more than $1 trillion. Our restrictive stance of monetary policy is putting downward pressure on economic activity and inflation. The committee decided at today's meeting to maintain the target range for the federal funds rate at five and a quarter to five and a half percent and to continue the process of significantly reducing our securities holdings. We are committed to achieving a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation sustainably down to two percent over time and to keeping poly policy restrictive until we are confident that inflation is on a path to that objective. We are attentive to recent data showing the resilience of economic growth and demand for labor, evidence of growth persistently above potential, or that tightness in the labor market is no longer easing, could put further progress on inflation at risk and could warrant further tightening of monetary policy. Financial conditions have tightened significantly in recent months, driven by higher longer-term bond yields, among other factors. Because persistent changes in financial conditions can have implications for the path of monetary policy, we monitor financial developments closely. In light of the uncertainties and risks and how far we have come, the committee is proceeding carefully. We will continue to make our decisions meeting by meeting based on the totality of the incoming data and their implications for the outlook and for economic activity and inflation, as well as the balance of risks. In determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate to return inflation to 2 percent over time, the Committee will take into account the cumulative tightening of monetary policy, the lags with which monetary policy affects economic activity and inflation, and economic and financial developments. We remain committed to bringing inflation back down to our 2 percent goal and to keeping longer-term inflation expectations well anchored. Reducing inflation is likely to require a period of below potential growth and some softening of labor market conditions. Restoring price stability is essential to set the stage for achieving maximum employment and stable prices over the longer run. To conclude, we understand that our actions affect communities, families, and businesses across the country. Everything we do is in service to our public mission 
we at the Fed will do everything we can to achieve our maximum employment and price stability goals. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Uh, Howard Schneider with Reuters. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Powell, for doing this. Uh, to what you referenced the, the rise in long term bond yields, to what degree did that supplant uh, action by the Fed at this meeting? Thanks for your question. So um, I'll talk about bond yields, but I, I want to take a second and just sort of set the broader context in which we're, we're looking at that. So if you, if you look at the situation, let's look at the economy first. Inflation has been coming down but it's still running well above our 2 percent target. The labor market has been rebalancing, but it's still very tight by many measures. GDP growth has been strong, although many forecasters are forecasting, and they have been forecasting, that it will slow. As for the committee, we are committed to achieving a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to 2 percent over time, and we're not confident yet that we have achieved such a stance. So that is the broader context in, into which this, the strong economy and all the things I said, that's the context in which we're looking at this question uh, of rates. So um, obviously we're, we're monitoring, we're attentive to the increase in longer term yields and which have contributed to uh, a tightening of broader financial conditions since the summer. As I mentioned, persistent changes in broader financial conditions can have implications for the path of monetary policy. In this case, the tighter financial conditions we're seeing from higher long-term rates, but also from other sources like the stronger dollar and, and lower equity prices could matter for future rate decisions as long as two, two conditions are satisfied. The first is that the tighter conditions would need to be persistent, and uh, that is something that remains to be seen. Um, but, but that's critical. We're, you know, if things are fluctuating back and forth, that's not what we're looking for. With financial conditions, we're looking for persistent changes that are material. The second thing is that, that, that the, the longer-term rates that have moved up, they can't simply be a reflection of, of expected policy moves from us uh, that we would then, if, that if we didn't follow through on them, then, then, the, then the rates would come back down. So the, and I would say on that, it does not appear that an expectation of higher near-term policy rates is causing the increase in longer-term rates. So um, in the meantime, though, uh, perhaps the most important thing is that these higher Treasury yields are showing through to higher borrowing costs for households and businesses, and those higher costs are going to weigh on economic activity to the extent this tightening persists. And, you know, the, the mind's eye goes to the 8 percent, near 8 percent uh, mortgage rate, which, which could have, you know, pretty significant effect on housing. So that's how I would answer your question. Just as a quick follow-on, to be clear on this, um, in your opening statement and just now, I, I, you, you seem to imply that you are not yet confident that financial conditions are restrictive enough to, to finish the fight. Is that true? Yes, that's exactly right. Um, you know, to say it a different way, we haven't made any decisions about, about future meetings. Um, we have not made a determination, uh, and we're not, I will say that we're, we're not confident at this time that we've reached such a stance. We're not confident that we haven't, but we're not confident that we have. And that's, that is, is the way we're going to be going into these future meetings is to be, you know, just determining the extent of any additional further policy may, uh, tightening that, that may be appropriate to return inflation to 2 percent over time. Hi, Chair Powell. Thank you so much for taking our questions. I wonder, you know, if you don't raise interest rates in December, would the presumption be that at that point that we should expect that rates are at their peak, or is there a possibility of restarting rate increases next year? And are there any costs to taking a more extended pause? So um, let me start by saying we haven't made a decision about September. You're asking a, a hypothetical there. But, but we're, we're going into this summer meeting. We'll get as you know, two more inflation readings, two more uh, labor market readings, some data on, uh, on economic activity. Uh, and so we'll be taking, and also the broader situation, the broader financial condition situation and, and the broader world situation. We'll be looking at all those things as we make a decision in December. We haven't made that decision. I would say, though, that, that uh, the idea that if you, the, the idea that you wouldn't, would be difficult to, to raise again after stopping for a meeting or two is just not right. I mean, the committee will always do what it, what it thinks is appropriate at the time. And again, we haven't made any decisions about, at all about December. We didn't even, we didn't talk about making a decision in December today. Really, it was a decision for this meeting and, and understanding broader things. Nick. 
Nick Timoros of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, Chair Powell, did the Fed staff put a recession back into the baseline forecast uh, in the materials for today's meeting? And how much does this tightening in financial conditions substitute for rate hikes if the tightening is persistent? You had said it was worth maybe a quarter point when we had the bank failures in the spring. What is it here on something that's presumably more straightforward and more familiar to simulate? So I guess uh, I don't want to answer your question about the um, about the recession, but the answer is no. I think I have to answer it since we since we did uh, publicly say in the minutes you'll you'll know anyway in the minutes the, the staff did not put a recession back in. Uh, I mean, it would be hard to see how you would do that if you look at the um, look at the activity we've seen recently, uh, which is not really indicative of, of a recession in the near term. In terms of um, how to think about translation into uh, rate hikes, I think it's it's just too early to be doing that. And the main reason is we just don't know how persistent this will be. You can see how volatile it is. Different kinds of news will affect the level of rates. And I think any kind of an estimate that was you know precise would hang out there and have a great chance of looking wrong very quickly. So I think what we can say is that financial conditions have have clearly tightened. And you can see that in the rates that, that consumers and, house, and households and businesses are paying now. And over time, that will have an effect. We just don't know how persistent it's going to be. And, and it's tough to try to translate that in a way that I'd be comfortable communicating into uh, how many rate hikes that is. If I could follow up, I guess what makes you confident that can... tighter what makes you confident that tighter financial conditions will slow above trend growth when 500 basis points of rate hikes, QT, and a minor banking crisis have not thus far? Well, I just that that's uh, uh, you know the way our policy works is, and sometimes it works with lags, of course, which can be long and variable. But ultimately, if you if you raise the, the you know raise interest rates, you do see. Uh, the, those effects, and you see those effects in the economy now. You see what's happening in the housing market. You're seeing that now. You're, you'll see, uh, if you look at surveys uh, of people, it's not a good time, they think, to buy durable goods of various kinds because rates are so high now. Uh, I mentioned, again, we're, we're getting reports from housing that the effects of this of this could be quite significant. But you're right. The, this has been a resilient economy, and it's, I think, been surprising in its resilience, and there are, there are a number of possible reasons why that may be. Um, our job is to, is, to, is to achieve maximum employment and price stability, and so we take the economy as it comes. It has been resilient, uh, so we just uh, we take it as it is. Colby. Thank you. Colby Smith with the Financial Times. In terms of the thresholds that you've laid out um, of what could warrant further tightening, um, the additional evidence of persistently above trend growth or some kind of reversal in the recent easing of labor market tightness, that seems to suggest something more powerful than just one more quarter point rate hike would be necessary. And I'm just curious if, if that's how the, the committee sees it. So we've identified those factors. Those those are not meant to be the only factors or a specific test that we're going to be applying with with some metrics behind it. Really, we're going to be looking at the broader picture, and you know what's happening with our progress to, toward the two percent inflation goal. Is the labor market continuing to broadly cool off and achieve a better balance? We'll be looking at that. You know, growth. We look at growth insofar as it, it has implications for our two mandate goals. We look at that. And we look at broader financial conditions. So we'll be looking at all of those things as we reach a judgment, uh, you know, whether we need to further tighten policy. And if we do reach that judgment, then we will further tighten policy. Okay. And, and just in terms of the tightening of financial conditions, if that is having some kind of offsetting um, effect in terms of the need to potentially, again, raise rates, what then is the potential impact on the trajectory of, of rate cuts? Could we see those maybe pulled forward or have to see um, more than, than what the September SEP indicated? So it's, it's, the fact is the committee is not thinking about rate cuts right now at all. We're not talking about rate cuts. We're still very focused on the first question, which is have we, re have we achieved a stance of monetary policy that's sufficiently restrictive to bring, in bring inflation down to 2 percent over time sustainably? That is the question we're focusing on. The next question, as you know, will be for how long will we remain restrictive? Will policy remain restrictive? And what we said there is that we'll, we'll keep policy restrictive until we're confident that inflation is, is on a sustainable path down to 2 percent. That'll be the next question. But honestly, right now, we're really tightly focused on the first question. The question of rates cuts just, just doesn't come up because I think it, the, the first, it's so important to get that first question 
you know, as, as close to right as you can. Steve Leisman, CNBC. Mr. Chairman, I guess I had assumed that there was a tightening bias in the committee. You say in the statement you're looking to assess the appropriate stance of monetary policy, uh, the extent to which uh, you, may, you may need to hike additionally. You, you didn't say earlier that you were sufficiently restrictive. There were forecasts for two rate hikes among most members of the committee. But then you just said that, you know, we're, we, don't, we haven't made a determination. Would you say the bias right now is neutral, that there is no disposition to hike again, and that the committee largely has moved off of this forecast for two hikes? For, for, for one additional I hike? I think you're talking about one additional. Yeah, no, I, I, no I, I wouldn't say that at all. I would say, I mean, the, the language, you know, looking at it here, uh, in determining the extent of additional policy firming that may be appropriate to return inflation 2 percent over time, that's the question we're asking. So, so is it right to think of that as a, a hiking bias is still in the committee here? We haven't used that term, but y y it's fair to say that's the question we're asking is should we hike more? It's not, it's not uh, you know, and that, that, that is the question. And you're right that it, in September we wrote down one additional rate hike. But, you know, we'll write down another forecast, as you know, in December. Chris. Uh, thank you. Chris Rugaber at Associated Press. Um, well, since the last meeting, the auto workers' strike has finished. Uh, oil prices have leveled off. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, you have the outbreak of war between uh, Israel and Hamas. How do you see all those factors taken together affecting the economy uh, going forward? How are you thinking about those? Um, so th there are significant issues out there. As you, as you point out, um, global uh, geopolitical tensions are certainly elevated. And that goes for the war in Ukraine. It goes for the war between Israel and Hamas. Uh, we're monitoring that. Our job is to monitor those things for their economic uh, implications. Um, so the UAW strike, as you point out, is, is, um, uh, appears to be coming to an end. Oil prices have flattened out. They haven't gone down, but I guess they've gone down a little bit from their earlier peak. Um, another one is the, the possibility of government shutdown. We don't know about that one. So there's plenty of, of risk out there. Um, but I, I would go back to the you know, the bigger picture for, from our standpoint is, is we've got a very strong economy, strong labor market, making progress on the labor market, making progress on inflation. And um, we're very focused on f uh, getting confident that we have achieved a stance of monetary policy that is sufficiently restrictive. That's really our focus. Great. And just one quick thing. You uh, last month had gone to York, Pennsylvania, where you talked to a lot of, or yeah, last month, where you talked to a lot of small business owners. Just curious, what sentiments did you hear from them, or what did you pick up on, and what would you was there anything that surprised you the most in terms of what they talked about? I wouldn't say I was terribly surprised. I was I was very impressed by uh, York as a town with a real strategy, and I would say it's uh, it's very impressive what the people there uh, have have put together uh, in the face of you know some difficult longer run trends about offshoring of manufacturing and that kind of thing. They've they've done a, a great job. As a, as a city, I think. You know, what you hear and it's, is c consistent there, which is people are really suffering under high inflation. You were there. We talked to some people who, you know, were feeling that in their businesses and other people who were feeling it in their home lives as well. You know, it's, it's painful for people, particularly people who, you know, who don't have a lot of extra financial resources, who are spending most of their incoming uh, you know, income on uh, the, the essentials of life. So we know that. It, that, that wasn't new, but that did come through very clearly uh, in, in, in the conversations we had in New York. And, you know, I, I walked away from that even, you know, I mean, just thinking that, that we really, the, the best thing we can do for the U.S. is to restore price stability, uh, fully restore price stability and not fail in that task and do it as quickly as possible, but, but also with the least damage we we can. Rachel. Hi, Chair Powell. Rachel Siegel from The Washington Post. Thanks for taking our questions. You've spoken before about the pain that would likely be coming for the economy in order to get inflation down. But since the economy has not responded to rate hikes in ways that would normally be expected, have you changed your views on that at all, on how necessary or inevitable that kind of pain would be, say, for the labor market or overall growth? Well, I think everyone has been very gratified to see 
that we've been able to achieve, you know, pretty significant progress on inflation without seeing the kind of increase in unemployment that has been very typical of rate hiking cycles like this one. So that's that's a historically unusual and and very welcome result. And the same is true of growth. You know, we've we've been saying that we need to see below potential growth, and growth has been strong, but yet we're still seeing this. I think I still believe, and my colleagues for the most part, I think, still believe that it is likely to be true. It is still likely to be true, not a certainty, but likely that we will need to see some slower growth and some softening in the labor market, in labor market conditions to get, to, you know, to, to fully restore price stability. So, but it's, a, it's only a good thing that we haven't seen, and I think we know why. <clears throat> you know, since, since we lifted off, we've, we have understood that there are really two processes at work here, one of, them, one of which is the unwinding of the distortions to both supply and demand from the pandemic and the response to the pandemic. And the other is, is you know, restrictive monetary policy, which is moderating demand and giving the supply side time to, time to recover, time and space to recover. So you see those two forces now working together to bring down inflation. But it's that, that first one can bring down inflation without the need for higher unemployment or slower growth. It's just it's supply, you know, supply side improvements like um, shortages and bottlenecks and that kind of thing going away. It's getting, you know, a significant increase in the size of the labor market now, both from labor force participation and from immigration. That's a big supply side, uh, you know, gain that is really helping the economy. And it's part of why part of why GDP is so high is because we're getting that that supply. So we welcome that. Um, but I think those things will run their course. And we're probably still going to be left, we think, and I think, we'll still be left with, a, with some ground to cover to get back to full price stability. And, and that's where monetary policy and, and what we do in, with demand is, is still going to be important. And I'm curious if, against that backdrop, if you've gotten any clarity <clears throat> on lags, if you have an economy that's been so resilient to high rate increases, does that suggest to you that there isn't necessarily this huge wave of tightening that's still coming through the pipeline and that it may have already come into effect? You know, I, I continue to think it's very hard to say. So it's, it's been one year at this meeting. Uh, one year ago, this was the fourth of our 75 basis points hike, hikes. So that's a full year since then. I think we are seeing the effects of, of all the hiking we did last year, and, and this year we're seeing it. It's very hard to know exactly what that might be. But you can, for example, an, an example of where, where you wouldn't have felt this yet is, is debt that had been termed out. Uh, it, but it's going to come due and have to get rolled over next year or the year after. So, and there are little things like that where the effects are just taking time to get into the economy. So I don't, uh, I, th I think we have to make monetary policy under great uncertainty about how long the lags are. I think trying to make a clear, get a clear answer and say, oh, I'm just going to assume this is a really not a good way to do it. And this is one of the reasons why we have slowed the process down this year, was to give monetary policy time to get into the economy. And it takes time, we know that, and you can't rush it. So doing slowing down is giving us, I think, a better sense of, of how much more we need to do if we need to do more. Michael McKee from uh, Bloomberg Television and Radio. Um, I'm trying to connect the dots here. Uh, one quick clarification I want to ask uh, about um, Rachel's question is you said you need slower growth. You had always said before a period of lower uh, than trend growth. Uh, has that changed? And two, it sounds to me like uh, you're basically saying here that the kind of the dot plots out the window, that every meeting is live with the possibility of a rate increase for right now, doesn't matter about the turn of the, uh, the year, and that there's not an objective way to determine whether or not you've got enough uh, tightening in the system. It's uh, just going to be a sub subjective judgment meeting by meeting. Well, so let's talk about the dot plot first. So the dot plot is a is a <clears throat> a picture in time of what the people on the committee thinks is likely to be a mo appropriate monetary policy in light of their own personal economic forecast. In principle, when things change, it's not that's not like a plan that anybody's agreed to or that we will do. That's a forecast that would change. For example, I mean, many things could change that would cause people to say. I wouldn't write down that dot, you know, six weeks later. Think of the number of things that could change your mind on that. So I think, I think the, the efficacy of the 
dot plot probably decays over the three month period between that meeting and the next meeting. But nonetheless, it's, it's out there and we don't, we, we do personally uh, update our forecast, but we don't formally update the dot plot. So, you know, I, I think we try to be as transparent as we can about the way we're thinking about these things. We, we're, we're laying out there our thinking and, you know, as we approach the meeting, we'll, we'll all be, you know, my colleagues and I will be talking about how we're processing that data. In terms of, <clears throat> so I, I, we're not really changing the way, in terms of uh, growth, uh, what I said was below potential. So what, what you have here recently is growth that is, that is um, temporarily, potential growth is elevated for a year or two right now over its trend level. So the right way to think about it is what's potential growth this year. Our trend, people think trend growth over a long period of time is a little bit less than 2% or I would say just around 2%. But um, what we've had is with, with the, you know, improvement in the size of the labor force, as I mentioned, through both participation and uh, immigration, and with the, the, you know, the better functioning in the labor market and with, with uh, the, you know, the unwinding of the supply chain and shortages and those kinds of things, you're seeing actually elevated potential growth. There's catch-up growth that can happen in potential. And that means that if you're grow you could be growing at 2% this year and still be growing, growing below the increase in the potential output of the economy. I hope that's clear. That's really what's going on. That's, that's why I would say it as below potential. But if you could uh, <clears throat> clarify what I asked about the, uh, meeting by meeting, are we essentially now supposed to assume that it's a meeting by meeting, live meeting with a chance of a rate increase that will be decided on uh, subjective uh, criteria rather than objective at each meeting? I, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know that I want to just accept anybody's characterization of it. I'll, I'll tell you how we're doing this. So <clears throat> we're going meeting by meeting. We're asking ourselves whether we've achieved a stance of policy that is sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation down to 2% over time. That's the question we're asking. We're looking at the full range of economic data, including financial conditions and all of those things that we look at. And then we're, we're you know, we, we've, 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 we've come very far with this rate hiking cycle, very far. And you saw the spread at, in, at the September meeting of, you know, it's a relatively small spread of people think one or two additional hikes. So you're close to the, to the end of the cycle. That's, that was an impression as of, a belief as of September. It's not a promise or a plan of the future. And so we're going into these meetings one by one. We're looking at the data. As I mentioned, we're also, you know, we've, we're, being, we're being careful. We're proceeding carefully because we can proceed carefully at this time. Monetary policy is restrictive. We see its effects, uh, particularly in interest-sensitive interest spending and other channels. So that's how I think about it. <clears throat> Neil. Thanks. Uh, hi, Chair Powell. Neil Irwin with Axios. Um, in light of the run-up in long-term yields we've seen the last several weeks, uh, have you given any consideration to the pace of your asset runoff program? Uh, and if there were a judgment that, higher, that the uh, higher term premium was endangering the dual mandate goals, would that be reason to think about slowing or suspending QT, or should we think of that as more of a technical question around reserves? So committee is not considering uh, changing the pace of balance sheet runoff. It's not something we're talking about or considering. Um, and I, I know there are, there are many candidate explanations for why rates have been going up. Uh, and QT is certainly on that list. It may be playing a relatively small effect, although I would say at $3.3 trillion in reserves, it's not, I think, I think it's hard to make a case that reserves are even close to scarce at this point. So that's not something that we're, that we're looking at right now. <clears throat> Victoria. Hi, uh, Victoria Guido with Politico. I wanted to ask about the Basel III uh, endgame capital proposal. Uh, you know, you've gotten a lot of pushback from people on different aspects of the proposal, and you yourself expressed some reservations. And I'm just curious, um, could you accept finalizing that proposal without significant changes? So that proposal is out for comment, and uh, we expect a lot of comment. We won't get those comments until the end of, uh, well, until well into next year. You know, we've extended the deadline. And we'll take them seriously. We'll read them. Well, I, I'll say what, what I do expect is that we will, we will come to a, we're a consensus-driven organization. We'll come to a package that, that has broad support on the board. So does broad support mean more support than the proposal had? It means broad support. John 
Janelle Marte with Bloomberg. So um, in addition to persistence, when you look at long-term treasury yields, what else are you watching to evaluate how those tighter financial conditions are hitting the economy and if it will lessen the need for further tightening? Also, do you think that those higher yields could affect um, banking stress? So what do we look at? <clears throat> we look at a very wide range of financial conditions. And in fact, as, as you'll know, uh, uh, different organizations publish different financial conditions indexes, which can have you know seven or eight variables, or they can have a hundred variables. So there's a there's a very rich environment, and we, we tend to look at a few of them. I'm not going to give you the names, but there you know there are a few of the common ones that people look at, and so they're looking at things like the level of the dollar, the level of equity prices, uh, the level of rates, the credit spreads. Sometimes uh, they're, they're pulling in credit availability and things like that. So it isn't any one thing. We, we would never look at, for example, long-term Treasury rates in isolation, uh, nor would we ignore them. But we, we would look at them as, bro as part of a broader picture. And they do play a role, of course, in, in many uh, of the major standard uh, financial condition indexes. Your second question was? Uh, banking stress. So it's something we're watching. As you know, we, we did have, um, there were issues with interest rate risk uh, and also, um, you know, uh, funding uninsured deposits uh, in, in the March, the things we went through in March and thereafter. And so we've been working a lot with financial institutions to make sure that they have uh, good funding plans and good, and, uh, and that they have a plan for how to deal with, with um, you know, the kind of portfolio uh, unrealized losses that they have. We do think the banking system is is quite resilient. We we had you know a handful of bank failures, but uh, so that's that's what we're out there doing, and um, we don't have any reason to think that this that these right hikes uh, are materially changing that picture, which is one of a strong banking system and one where there's a, a strong focus by banks and by supervisors on liquidity, on funding, and, and those sorts of things. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Scott Horsley from NPR. Last week, you and your colleagues put forward a proposal to lower the cap on debit card swipe fees for, for comment. Could you just talk a little bit about uh, the considerations there, what it would mean for merchants, for banks, for consumers, and also just what y'all are seeing in terms of the use of both debit and credit cards in the, in the payment system? You know, <clears throat> so you're right. We, we, we put a proposal out for comment is what we did. And you know this is this is a job that Congress assigned us, as you, as you of course know, uh, in Dodd Frank. And all we can really do is faithfully implement the statute. That's that's all we're trying to do. What else can we really do? Um, it's a 90-day comment period. Uh, we typically don't comment on these things once they're out for out for comment. And we do hope that stakeholders, and we know that they will use this opportunity to express their views. They haven't been shy about that. So that's that's critical, and that's that's what I can say about that now. <clears throat> Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, Edward Lawrence with Fox Business. So over the last um, three months, the year-over-year -year PCE inflation was at 3.4 percent, core well over 3 percent. You've said in the past 2 percent remains the Federal Reserve target, but with no rate increase today, how long would you be okay then with a 3 percent or 3 percent plus overall inflation? You know, the, <clears throat> the progress is probably going to come in lumps and be bumpy, but we're making progress. You know, I think, I think the core PCE came down by almost 60 basis points in the third quarter. So if you, I, the best thing I could point to you to would be the um, September SEP, where uh, you know, the expectation was that, that inflation by the end of next year on a 12-month 12, 12 trailing basis would be well into the twos, and the year after that, further into the twos. So that's, that's, if you look historically, that's, that's sort of consistent with the way inflation comes down. It does take some time, and as you get you know, as, as you get uh, further and further from those highs, it may actually take longer time. But the good, good news is we're, you know, we're making progress and monetary policy is restrictive and we feel like we're on a path uh, to make more progress and it's essential that we do. Well, you said in the past that doing too little on interest <clears throat> rates could take years to fix, but the cost of doing too much could be easily fixed. How robust was the debate about this pause on the doing too little side? That's always the, the question we're asking ourselves. And um, y y we know that if we, if we fail to restore price stability, the risk is that 
expectations of higher inflation get entrenched in the economy, and we know that that's really bad for people. Inflation will be both more high, uh, both higher and more volatile. That's that's a prescription for misery, and and so um, we're really committed to not letting that happen. Um, you know, for the first year or so of our tightening cycle, the risk was all on the side of not doing enough. We're you know we're we've come far enough that that the risks are, you know have gotten more two-sided. You can't identify that with a lot of precision, but it does feel like the, the risks are, are more two-sided now. Um, and, um, but we're, we're committed to getting inflation back down to our target over time, and we will. Uh, Simon Rabinovich with The Economist. Um, quick follow-up to the question about banking stresses. Uh, you talked about how the banking system is resilient. Uh, of course, part of the resilience of the past year stems from the, the bank term funding program that you launched in March. Um, given that bond prices have not recovered, that unrealized losses are probably mounting, how likely is it that you might have to extend that program uh, in March next year? Um, good question. We're, we, haven't really, we haven't really been thinking about that yet. We, uh, um, you know, it's it's November one, and that's a decision we'll be making in the first quarter of next year. Great. Um, sorry, quick separate question about uh, inflation expectations. The U uh, Michigan <clears throat> sentiment survey showed a big jump in one year ahead inflation expectations last month from 3.2 to 4.2. Last year, you said that particular survey was a really decisive factor in one of your rate hike decisions. Uh, if it stays elevated uh, next time around, how big of an input will that be into your December thinking? Yeah, we we look at a. A range of, of things. Uh, I, I think the, the the you know the UM thing got blown out of proportion a little bit. It was actually a preliminary estimate that got revised away, and and I said it was preliminary in that, but that didn't get picked up. So uh, we we look at many many things, and so really look across the broad array of surveys and also market based estimates, and you know and we do that really carefully at every meeting and between meetings, and you know there, there's it's just clear that inflation expectations are in a good place. The public does believe that, that inflation will get back down to 2 percent over time, and, uh, and it will. They're right. So, uh, and, and there's no real crack in that, in that uh, armor. You can always find one reading that is a little bit out of whack, uh, but, but honestly, the bulk of them are, are just very clear that, that uh, the public believes that inflation will come down. And that's, of course, we, we believe that's critical in winning the battle. Hi, Chair Powell. Megan Casella with Barron's. Thanks for taking our questions. I wanted to see if you could talk about the neutral rate. You mentioned today that you're still debating whether rates are sufficiently restrictive, and you've recently said that um, evidence is suggesting policy is not too tight right now. So I was curious if you could elaborate on that at all and whether that means the neutral rate, in your view, has risen. Yeah. Um, so first thing to say is that it's very important. It's a very important variable in, in the way we think about monetary policy, but you can't identify it with any precision in real time. And we know that. So you have to just take that. You have to take your estimate of it with a grain of salt. Um, what we know now is, you know, within a range of estimates of the neutral rate, policy is, is, uh, is restrictive. Uh, and it's therefore putting downward pressure on economic activity, hiring and inflation. So we do we do talk about this. There's we're, there's not any debate or you know attempt to you know f to sort of agree as a group on what whether our star has moved or not. Some people think it has. Some people haven't said that don't think it has. Ultimately, it's it's unknowable. And so really, again, what we're focused on is you know looking at the data and giving ourselves a little more time now to look carefully at the data <clears throat> by being careful in our, in our moves, does it, does it feel like monetary policy is restrictive enough to bring inflation down to 2 percent over time? That's the question we're asking ourselves. Um, I, I think, you know, years from now, economists will be revising their estimates of, of R star as it existed on November 1, 2023. You can't, we can't really wait for that in making policy. We have to Look, we have to we have to have those models and look at them and think about them. But ultimately, we've got to look at the effects of po that policy is having, accounting for the lags, which makes it difficult. If I could follow up on a wages point earlier, you talked about the inflation outlook, but I'm curious if you have any concerns whether wage inflation um, at its current level could be 
could risk pushing up overall inflation or reacceleration. So if you look at the look at the broad range of wages, um, they have all, the in, wage increases have really come down significantly over the course of the last 18 months to a level where they're substantially closer to that level that would be consistent with 2 percent inflation over time, making standard assumptions about productivity over time. So it's much closer than it was. Uh, and that's true of uh, the ECI, which is a, the one that's the one that we, we got this week. It's true of um, average hourly earnings and compensation per hour, too. So and all of them are kind of saying that, which is great. And you have to look at a group of them because any one of them can be idiosyncratic from at, in any given reading. So that's what you see. Uh, and so what you saw with the ECI reading was if you look if you look back a couple comes out four times a year. If you look back a couple of quarters, you'll see it was much higher and then it came down substantially in June. And then the September reading was more or less at the same level as the June reading. So in a way, it's just validating that decline. And it was very close to our expectations internally, too. So I think we feel good about that. Also, I would say it, it isn't in my thinking. It's not the case that that wages have been the principal driver of inflation um, so far, although I, I think it's all I do think it's fair to say that as we go forward, as monetary policy becomes more important relative to the supply side issues I talked about and the unwinding of the pandemic effects, it may be that that the, the labor market is becomes more important over time, too. Nancy. Hi, Nancy Marshall Genser <clears throat> with Marketplace. Um, Chair Paul, are you now as concerned about overshooting and raising interest rates too much as you are about getting inflation down to the 2 percent target? So I, I, as I mentioned, um, I think for much of the last year and a half, the concern was not doing too much, too, too, not doing enough. It was not getting rates high enough in time to avoid having inflation expectations, higher inflation expectations become entrenched. So that was the concern. I think we've reached, a, a, you know, now more than 18 months into this. You can see by the fact that we have slowed down, although that we're, still, we're, still, we're still trying to gain confidence in, in what the appropriate stance is. But you can see that um, we think, and I think, that the risks are, are getting more balanced. I'll just say that. They're getting more balanced. The risk of doing too much versus the risk of doing too little are getting are getting cl more closer to balance because policy is clear. I think clearly restrictive at five and a quarter to five and a half percent that that range. You're if you, you take off a, a mainstream estimate of the of the uh, expected inflation, take one year inflation, you're going to see that you're going to see a, a real policy rate that is you know well above mainstream estimates of of a neutral policy rate. Now that's. That's arithmetic. It doesn't really. It, what, what the proof is really in how the economy reacts. But I, I, I would say that we're we're in a place where where those risks are getting closer to being in balance. And you said the proof is how the economy reacts. What are you looking at to be sure you're not overshooting? Well, I think <clears throat> what we're looking at is are are we still is inflation still broadly cooling? Do we? Is it sort of validating the, the, the path we saw over the summer uh, where inflation was clearly cooling and coming down? Now, we've seen periods like that before, and they've just they, there hasn't been follow through. The data have bounced back. So what are we seeing? You know, are we, are we seeing is inflation still coming down? So that's the, the first thing. Second thing is, in the labor market, um, what we've seen is a, a very positive rebalancing of supply and demand partly through just much more supply coming online and and with with labor demand still clearly remaining very strong when you're when, when you have the kind of job growth we've had over the last quarter it's still very strong demand so and you see wage increases coming down as we, we discussed but coming out coming down you know in a kind of gradual way um, I think that's what we want to see that that whole set of processes continue Right, Mena, CNN. Um, uh, do you think that there ha has been any structural change in either consumption or in the job market that's uh, pushing up consumption? Uh, you obviously saw the third quarter GDP figures, which were strong, and some economists have expected everyone's spending to have fizzled out by now. So I'm kind of wondering if, uh, if there's been, been any structural change in consumption. 
Um, I wouldn't say there's been a structural change in consumption. I would say it's certainly um, been strong. And so a couple of things. We may have underestimated the, the balance sheet strength of households and small businesses, and that may be part of it. Um, there may be, you know, we've been, like everyone else, trying to estimate the number of the amount of savings that, that, uh, that households have from the pandemic when they couldn't spend on services really at all <clears throat> or, or, you know, in-person services. And, you know, there can still be more of that than we think, although at a certain point we have to, we're going to be getting back to pre-pandemic levels of savings. We may not be there yet. So things are, for clearly people are still spending. The dynamic has been really strong job creation with now wages that are, that are higher than inflation in the aggregate anyway. And that raises real disposable income. And that raises spending, which continues to drive more hiring. And so you've had a really, that, that, whole, that whole dynamic has been, <clears throat> and also at the same time, um, the pandemic effects are wearing off so that goods availability, automobile availability is better or was better. I think it still is. And, there, and from, a, from a business standpoint, there are more people to hire. And you know, there's more labor supply. So the whole thing has led to more growth, more spending, and that kind of thing. And it's been, you know, it's been good. And, and the thing is, we've been achieving progress on inflation in the middle of this. So um, it's been a, a dynamic. The question is, how long can that continue? And, you know, I just think this, the, the existence of this second set of factors at this time, which is the unwinding of the pandemic effects, that's what makes this cycle uh, unique, I think. And, you know, we're still learning. Uh, it, that that took longer for that process to begin than we thought, and we're still learning about how it plays out. That's, that's all we can do. So to Daniel, <clears throat> the last question. Thank you, Chair Powell. Um, Daniel Levis from uh, Agence France Press. Um, just a quick question following up uh, on an earlier one. Um, uh, with regards to the Israel-Hamas uh, conflict, um, you know, uh, the Fed's financial stability report said the Israel-Hamas conflict and the conflict in Ukraine pose important risks to global economic activity, including the possibility of sustained disruptions to regional trade in food, energy, and other commodities. You've had organizations like the World Bank warning of a possible uh, you know, surge in oil prices if the war uh, spreads <clears throat> to other countries in the region. I'm just wondering how the Fed is monitoring these developments in the Middle East. You mentioned they are. And, and, and just what you know, the potential economic impact could be if the conflict does spread to other countries in the region. Thank you. Uh, I wouldn't want to speculate too much, but I'll just say so, you know, really the question there is, does the war spread more widely and does it start to do things like affect oil prices in particular, since this is the Middle East we're talking about? <clears throat> the price of oil has really not reacted very much so far to this. As, you know, as the Fed, as, as the, the Federal Open Market Committee, our job is really to talk about to understand the economy and the economic effects. And it's, it isn't clear at this point that the conflict in the Middle East is going to, is on track to have significant economic effects. That doesn't mean it isn't incredibly important and something for people to, uh, you know, to take, take great, really important notice of. But it may or may not turn out to be something that matters for the Federal Open Market Committee as an economic body. But the, what the, so what the Financial Stability Report does is it calls out risks. And that's what it's doing is calling out a risk of that. And the war in Ukraine, the same. The war in Ukraine you know, did have immediately very significant macroeconomic implications because of the connection to commodities. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. And of course, that was Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell addressing reporters after the Fed's decision to hold rates steady. The central bank has raised rates to the highest level in 22 years in its effort to combat inflation, but it's holding here. And just uh, recapping some of the commentary that uh, the chair made in the conference here, he talked about the strong commitment on the part of the Fed to a return inflation to the 2% objective. He talked about the effect of the bond market, what's been happening there and tightening of financial conditions. And he says the Fed really wants to see a persistent tightening. We've seen a lot of volatility in the bond market. It seems like he wants to see more stability there. But I think most interesting and important for the market, the read here, 
seems to be, when you look at the stock reaction and the bond reaction, seems to be what the Fed chair did not say. He did not say anything to disabuse the market of its belief that the Fed is finished here. Even though some of his words seem to indicate otherwise, just looking at some of the interpretations by the likes of the Wall Street Journal's Nick Timoreos, for example, he tweeted uh, that Powell did little to talk up the projection of one more hike from the median step, that is, dot plot submission in September. He said they'd simply submit new projections in December. Yeah. So, and uh, I would argue, I agree with all that. There's also a lot of focus on the fact that they did sneak in the word financial into a sentence here. They said tighter financial and credit conditions in the for, statement. right for households and businesses are likely to weigh on economic activity. In other words, this this theme we come back to that the bond market is doing the work for them. Economist David Rosenberg here saying the tightening in financial conditions since that September meeting has been the equivalent, he says, to at least two hikes. So he tells his clients enough is enough. The Fed looks done. And to your point, I just see a bunch of green on my screen here for the equity markets. That's true. Although Rosie does always think the sky is falling, to be fair. David Rosenberg, that is. To be fair. But, it's not um, a knock on Rosenberg. Rosie, I would love to have you on. A, you know that. Agreed. And <laughs> um, Powell also continued to sort of express his distaste for the summary of the economic projections, a.k.a. the SEP, a.k.a. the dot plot. He said the efficacy of the dot plot does decay over three months. Um, in other words, it sort of is dated once the Fed comes out with it. Things change. The um, circumstances, economic circumstances change here. So all of that is interesting as well. One of the other things, you know, he was asked about what the Fed is watching here and why there's been such a lag. What should we be looking for? One of the things he pointed to is that a lot of borrowers, particularly mortgage borrowers, have locked in lower rates. And they haven't had to because they are not selling their homes. They're not being forced to sell. They're not being forced to refinance. Once we see that wave, and they're confronted with higher rates, that's when you'll get the lag effect. Now, when will that happen? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of discussion about when that will happen. We talked about the note from Morgan Stanley uh, that was out late last month that we talked about yesterday where they said the wealthy, for example, you know, maybe they'll be pinched when they start to lose their jobs and then you'll see some forced selling of a home, for example. So in other words, we don't know. It's difficult yeah. to predict. It's still feeding through. And, and yeah. part of that, too, is obviously, and we've talked about this, I mean, consumers and businesses entered this period of higher rebarring costs, right? They had solid cash levels, so it's taking a way to work through that. I thought some of this commentary, Julie, we were talking about, though, too, about inflation was interesting. I mean, listen, we know that target is still well above what he wants, so his words exactly were still a long way to go on that inflation fight. Yeah, most definitely. Let's take a look at the markets in a little more detail here as we see uh, stocks rising really to their highs of the session right now. Uh, all three major averages in the green here with the NASDAQ leading as we see rates not doing much of it. You know, we didn't see an increase in rates in this meeting, which again is another sort of emphasizing point here that the market does not see uh, today's presser as an indication that the Fed is going to raise rates in December. And you see there the drop that we are seeing in yields now, the 10-year yield back below 4.8 percent. Uh, within stocks, tech, not surprising given the Nasdaq's lead, is doing the best along with communication services. Utilities also rising and consumer discretionary. All of the groups in the S&P 500 are up right now, Josh. All right. For more Fed reaction, let's turn to Mona Mahajan, Edward Jones, senior investment strategist. Mona, let me get your take, first of all, on the news. What did you make of the Fed's decision today? And also, I'm just I'm looking at my screen right now. I have green everywhere. Mona. I have three indexes all in the green, led, by the way, by the Nasdaq, up about one and a half percent right now. Yeah, you know, one of the things I took away was when uh, Jerome Powell said that there's better balance between raising rates and cutting rates right now. You know, keep in mind, earlier in the year, he said there's more risk to not doing as much. So his bias was to continue to raise to make sure that inflation headed towards uh, more resolutely that 2% target. Now it feels like the risks are more balanced. There is a risk if they continue at this pace that they could actually hurt the economy there could be an impact on the consumer consumption broadly, and something in the system may break over time. And so I do think him expressing that better balance between rate cuts and rate hikes um, implies for the markets that we are closer to the end than we were earlier this year, certainly. 
and probably going forward as well. Um, hey, Mona, it's Julie here. It's good to see you. Balance does seem to be the word. I was hearing this word a lot today, even in advance of the Fed's meeting, right, that there was this expectation that that would be sort of the tone that Jay Powell would try to strike. Um, for lack of a better word, is this good? In other words, um, is it good that the Fed, if the Fed is indeed done, is it good that they're done? Or is it not good because it implies that we are sort of on a knife's edge here? Yeah, you know, look, I think looking at the economic backdrop, um, we certainly aren't seeing any imminent sort of downturn. We got Q3 GDP figures at 4.9%. I mean, really well above trend levels. Granted, that's backward looking. And as we look at the quarters ahead, we are seeing a bit of softness emerge. You know, certainly the consumer has some emerging headwinds. Not only are rates and mortgage rates elevated, we are also seeing uh, increased bank lending standards or more tighter bank lending standards. And we're also seeing those excess savings that the consumers had post-pandemic starting to get worked down. So those headwinds are very real, something that the Fed watches closely as well. Um, but, you know, on the other hand, as the consumer potentially softens, as that labor market, as Jerome Powell noted, potentially opens up a bit, um, cools somewhat, we are uh, likely to see better inflationary trends as well. So not only are we going to see better wage trends, and that would impact core inflation, but over time, we think areas like housing, shelter, rent prices that have decelerated in real time will show up in those CPI baskets with a lag as well. So I think the idea that the economy is cooling just enough to support inflation was a real takeaway. Um, and of course, we do think the Fed uh, does see a, a, a end in sight for its great uh, uh, hiking cycle, especially given what yields are doing in real time and what quantitative tightening has done in real time as well. So I'm going to add it up for us in terms of the equity market. Where do you think we're headed in the near to intermediate term? Because you know, there are some challenges, perhaps, but also I'm, I'm interested in how you think about seasonals. You know, CFRA Sam Stovall reminds us, hey, we're heading into the strongest six months of the year. That's what we're staring into. How does that play into your, 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 into your strategy and how you're thinking about where the market heads from here? Yeah, it's a great point. And look, we just went through a 10 percent correction in the S&P 500, slightly more in the NASDAQ. Um, and that does tend to be a good starting point, especially as we're heading towards November and December of, uh, you know, year end. And then when you look historically, an interesting fact, uh, since 1990, 11 times that Q3 has been negative, as it was this year, nine of those 11 times ended up positive in Q4 and positive by average of 10.6 percent. So we are looking at history on our side and potentially very favorably on our side. Now, we'd say is longer term as we head to towards potentially a period of economic softening, you could get volatility along the way. But we are setting up for 2024 that potentially you're looking at better inflation trends, a Fed that has definitively stepped to the sidelines, maybe even thinking about pivoting lower. And by the way, earnings trends that should reaccelerate. So not a bad backdrop heading into year end of 2024 and in year end of 2023 so as well. So you just buy the market and forget about it, you know, buy buy the SPY and you're done here, Mona? Or do you think you need to be more choosy and look at specific sectors in this environment? Yeah. Yeah, it's a great point. And certainly, you know, this year we've seen just a handful of sectors and, of course, a handful of stocks that have led the market higher. Um, we all know about that Magnificent Seven trade. Um, but as we look forward over the next, you know, 12 to 18 months, we do think there will be better balance in, in uh, market leadership and market participation. So we think... You know, while you don't wholesale give up on the AI technology trade, that's probably in the early innings of a long-term bull market itself. Uh, we want to make sure our portfolios are diversified with um, areas like cyclical sectors, parts of the value space, um, and even small caps and international over time, we think, play some uh, catch up here. And then, of course, let's not forget our bond portfolios, which now with better yields and better uh, potential for price appreciation if the Fed pauses and pivots lower, uh, certainly looking more and more attractive. Mona Mahajan, thank you so much for joining us, Mona. Uh, thank you, guys. <laughs> Federal Reserve decided to hold rates steady while Powell leaves the door open for another rate hike. Here with the latest on Fed Chair Powell's latest commentary on monetary policy, we have Yahoo Finance's Jennifer Schonenberg. Jennifer. Hey, Josh. Fed Chair Powell squarely keeping rate hikes on the table while acknowledging progress in inflation, but noting that it's going to take a while to get inflation back down to that 2 percent level. Fed Chair Powell says the Fed is still trying to determine whether rates are high enough and the committee has not moved off of one more rate hike. Take a listen.
the fact is the committee is not thinking about rate cuts right now at all. We're not talking about rate cuts. We're still very focused on the first question, which is have we, re have we achieved a stance of monetary policy that's sufficiently restrictive to bring, bring inflation down to 2 percent over time sustainably? Powell said he's not confident that financial conditions are restrictive enough at this point to bring inflation back down. In addressing long-term bond yields and how that may be factoring into monetary policy, he says those would need to be sustained, and right now those are fluctuating. He also said that the backup in yields would need to be driven by more than just expectations for higher rates from the Fed, and he doesn't think that that's the major driving factor now, so perhaps a positive there for the doves. Uh, Powell also noted that the staff, the committee staff of the Fed has not factored in a recession, though he still believes that below trend growth is necessary to bring inflation back down. Powell saying that every meeting is live. The idea that the Fed could go to meetings without raising rates and then be able to raise rates again at the next meeting is still very much on the table. Guys. Jennifer Schonberger, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Let's get back to Jared for a quick check of the markets, because, Jared, the market doesn't believe that an increase at the next meeting is very much on the table, do they? It is risk on, Julie. And let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive. <laughs> uh, we've seen stocks kind of, uh, they were not misbehaving earlier, although the small caps were in the red. They have now climbed into the green. Russell 2000 up half a percent, but the leader is the NASDAQ. That's up 1.6 percent. We got a little bit of movement at 2 p.m. and then uh, took out the prior low there, the intraday low, and then we was off to the races basically in the last 30 minutes of the Powell uh, testimony. I guess uh, I wouldn't call it testimony, I guess uh, just speaking to the press there. But the point is, we are at the highs of the days, and you got to wonder what is the next catalyst that could potentially be risk off? Uh, probably going to be some kind of macro data, inflation statistics, who knows? Uh, but I want to check in on the Treasury market. We've actually seen a bit more movement there. This is 10-year Treasury note futures. I'm using the futures because uh, the bond market closed it at 3 p.m. and we're seeing them continue to rise here. That means uh, long-term rates are going down. And we can also see that in the two-year. Now, the two-year more closely tracks what's happened with the Fed's uh, benchmark rate. That's even more, uh, I would guess, uh, I would say uh, receptive is more, um, I guess, influenced by it. So here we have our sector action. All 11 sector, well, I misspoke there. Uh, 10 sectors in the green, materials in the red there, but let's take a look at the number one sector, XLK. That is at the highs of the day. Uh, tech uh, looking up to a uh, point to gains at about 2% today. We can take a look at the NASDAQ 100, and we can see a lot of green on the screen right there. Apple up 1.8%, NVIDIA up 3.5%. I mentioned that uh, futures in rates were going up. That means long-term rates are going down. That is beneficial for a lot of these tech stocks, those long duration stocks. So NVIDIA at the highs of the days here. So all in all, probably gonna be gauged as a successful meeting for uh, Fed Chair Powell and the Federal Reserve in as much as they really did not upset markets. But I'm gonna leave you with this. This is a yield curve and how much it has changed over the prior three months. Here's where it is today. And here's where it was three months ago. A uh, huge movement here, and we still don't know exactly why. Jared Blickery, thank you for that. Let's get a check on oil prices. Yahoo Finances and Yez Frey has the details. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So we had opened the session higher this morning. We had seen a WTI that was up more than 2%, but then gave up those gains after EIA data showed that stockpiles last week rose more than expected. Look, we it's not been uncommon to see oil swinging by 2% uh, sometimes on a daily basis. Uh, tensions in the Middle East have made these prices volatile. Also, we did get some figures, so a China factory activity that contracted in October. That's from a private survey, adding to some concerns about the economic uh, recovery in China. So you had Brent crude that settled at $84.63 a barrel. You had WTI that settled at $80.44 a barrel. But there has been a trend that has been pretty consistent over the last month, and that has been gasoline prices, which have been falling.
So right now, the national average for a gallon of gasoline is sitting at $3.46. Uh, that's according to AAA. That's down 35 cents from a month ago. And we had some analysts that were predicting this, that were saying that you would see the gallon of gasoline down by anywhere between 25 cents and 50 cents a gallon. You've got the winter grade. You have lower seasonal demand, that seasonal demand that's been falling at the same time refiners are returning from maintenance, boosting supply. Californians even, they are even paying less for gasoline. And remember that just a month ago, they were paying uh, on average $6.06 per gallon. Right now, that's at $5.23 a gallon. So more than a 75 cent drop there, guys. And yes, thank you. Thank you. And coming up, block earnings after the bell tomorrow. We're gonna get a preview of those numbers and tell you everything you need to know next. 2023 rocked the markets. NVIDIA, the stock has been on a tear Silicon this Silicon Valley week. Bank's collapse is the second largest bank failure in the U.S. Inflation. Mortgage rates. The diabetes drug. Ozempic. Now it's time to make bold decisions. Yahoo Finance Invest. The marquee event for investors seeking big ideas and bold decisions. Guided by the newsroom you trust. Don't miss it, November 7th, exclusively on Yahoo Finance. No losses will be borne by the taxpayers. People of America need to know what happened at these banks. Back in March, when a fresh banking crisis reared its head, it wasn't a huge surprise when one man emerged as the financial sector's white knight. Turning now to our top story. First Republic Bank sold to J.P. Morgan Chase this morning in a government-led deal. Jamie Dimon, the 67-year-old CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, is no stranger to stepping in during times of turmoil. In 2008, he rescued Bear Stearns, now a relic of the financial crisis, but once a giant of the investment banking landscape. We did it because we were asked to, he'd say years later. 15 years on, it was Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen who pushed him to reprise that role by contributing billions alongside other big banks in an emergency infusion to First Republic. J.P. Morgan bought First Republic less than two months later from the FDIC. Wall Street's apparent savior was perhaps not the title Diamond was looking for, even if he was destined for it. 
Diamond's first job was at American Express as an assistant to his father's boss and family friend, Sandy Weil. Weil would become the seminal figure in Diamond's professional life for the better part of two decades. When he left Amex, Diamond followed him. By the age of 35, Weil promoted him to president of Primerica, making him one of the youngest leaders on Wall Street. The quick-thinking number cruncher had truly arrived, but his tenure at the newly created megabank Citigroup would be short-lived. Diamond was cut loose by his mentor, only to bounce back as CEO of Bank One and with a point to prove. He immediately bought two million shares of the company's stock, burnishing a reputation for putting his money where his mouth is. In 2004, J.P. Morgan Chase swooped up Bank One for $58 billion. The joke on the street was that they'd paid $58 billion for Jamie. Now, he's one of the longest running leaders on the street, and running a bank whose assets dwarf its rivals, it still regularly racks up record earnings. To some people, JP Morgan is its own economy. The man behind the fortress balance sheet says he is still going strong, and at what he calls the most dangerous time he's seen in decades. Tonight, right here at 6 p.m. Eastern, Yahoo Finance's very own executive editor, Brian Sazi, is sitting down with J.P. Morgan Chase chairman and CEO, Jamie Dimon. The timing, of course, could not be better considering what we heard from Fed Chair Jerome Powell. So a lot to talk about here this evening. We got the Fed, get his Mr. Dimon's take on the economy, the consumer, right? New proposed regulations we know he's not a fan of, right. AI, you name it. It would be a great conversation. Yeah, I mean, when we heard from him around earnings, he definitely seemed concerned about the state of geopolitics right now with the Israel-Hamas war. Of course, the Russia war with Ukraine uh, still happening as well. So he expressed concern on that front. He said mostly consumers have been holding up, although there are some concern. Obviously, they're going to roll over. So that's the backdrop then for the Fed standing pat on rates. We'll see if he had the same interpretation that the market had, mm -hmm. that the Fed is sort of done here. And if they're done, does Diamond think that that's the right decision? Is there still um, the likelihood or the possibility that something in the economy could break here? And of course, as you said, he's not happy about new banking requirements. No, not happy. Disappointed, I believe, is the word he's used repeatedly. Also, there was that headline, remember, recently, that he's going to sell some of his shares next year. Mm -hmm. And people started thinking very quickly, does that, you know, for the first time, does that mean he's already thinking about moving on? Now, the company was quick to say that's not what's going on. But it, listen, it brings up his tenure. He's been there almost 20 years. He's right. 67 years old. So it'd be interesting if he talks about that as well. Yeah, and the shares of J.P. Morgan are only up about 4% this year. We've mm -hmm. seen financials broadly sort of underperform. Uh, J.P. Morgan's been sort of middle of the pack here yep. um, in terms of stock performance, at least. In terms of financial performance, yeah. has still been uh, a strong performer. So, Topped expectations, boosted yep. guidance when they report. Yeah, it'll exactly. be one to watch. Yes, it will. There's one more that we're going to watch when it, <laughs> coming up tomorrow after the close. We're talking about Block here. It's set to report its earnings after the bell tomorrow. And despite huge losses this summer, the stock's down around 40% since July. Our next guest believes this is the perfect time to invest in the fintech firm. Jason Kupferberg, senior payments analyst at Bank of America Securities, joins us now. Maybe not despite, maybe because of the big decline, do you think now is the time? Do you think that people should be buying Block going into this print, Jason? We do have a buy rating on Block. We are positive on the company. We think the stock is oversold. We think that fundamentals over a multi-year period will be better than what the stock is currently reflecting. We think that there's an incredible amount of concern reflected at this multiple, both on the consumer-facing cash app side of the business, as well as the merchant-facing seller side of the business. And we see investor sentiment uh, probably being about as low as it's ever been in this stock. So we do see positive risk reward. And Jason, beyond you know, the stock, obviously, it, it's had a rough year. We're down 35% year to date. Beyond earnings, Jason, uh, are there certain dates that investors would have on the calendar as potential catalysts for this stock that you would look for? I think it's less about specific dates. I think it's more about a path of potential catalysts and what that could look like, for example. 
would be some amount of reacceleration in the merchant facing seller side of the business from a gross profit growth perspective. We do think that Q3 is going to feel some pressure in part because of the uh, platform outage that we saw in early September. We do think that there is the prospect for a little bit of reacceleration starting in the fourth quarter. The international side of the seller business is actually performing well and the company has recently pivoted their go to market strategy to be more vertically oriented. And that's a new change that started this past summer. We could see some uh, results from that in a positive fashion into 2024. The other potential part of the catalyst path could be some more significant cost cutting here at the company. We do think that as a result of a recent benchmarking exercise that we ran, there could be some real upside to the EBITDA performance of the business in 2024. And Jason, I think some investors in this space, you know, I think maybe some got a little spooked when French payments processing company Worldline cut its guidance. That did make some people nervous. Is is there any kind of read through the square or not or no? No read through from Worldline. They don't really have any operations in Germany. And that was the primary country that Worldline cited for weakness and other payments companies, uh, U.S. payments companies that have reported so far this earnings season um, have not identified that as a source of weakness either. Jason, when you talk about the vertical integration here, the news site, The Information, just took a look this week at the, what they call internal feuding at Block between Square and Cash App and sort of Jack Dorsey's now efforts to try to resolve that. Do you think he's going to be able to do that? Jack's one of the founders of the company, obviously, and has been the CEO since the beginning. He's got a lot of his personal net worth at stake here. He does not take an annual salary from Block. So he certainly would seem to have some pretty significant financial incentives to get things back on track. He is now also the leader of the seller side of the business after the head of that segment departed the company uh, almost two months ago. And so we do think one of the key aspects to this earnings call into the 2024 story will be his ability to lead that seller business and to execute on this new go-to-market strategy. And Jason, in terms of product innovation at the company, you know, anything um, existing now or in the pipeline that you think should have investors especially excited? I think at this point, they've actually delivered a lot of innovation and a lot of product to the market. We have seen some product extensions on the seller side. So for example, in the restaurant vertical earlier this year, they launched a kitchen display system to enable their product set to be more applicable to a little bit of a larger restaurant versus the traditional very small coffee shop or food truck uh, that seller would have been known for. Uh, so that's one example. Now I think the innovation needs to come more on the distribution side than the pure product side. And that's where I come back to that verticalized, feet on the street, go to market strategy focused in areas like retail and restaurant and others. Jason, how does um, Block's Bitcoin strategy look at this point to you? Um, obviously, Bitcoin itself has recovered a little bit, but you know, now that we're a little while in, uh, more than a little while in, I guess, to, to the investment, how, does it feel like a good fit for the business? Is it sort of just off to the side? What, how do you think about it? I would characterize it as being a little bit more off to the side at this point. The company has prudently cut back a lot of their operating expense investments in areas uh, like crypto, and, and I think that's what the investment community has, has wanted to see. That said, particularly on the consumer-facing cash app side of the business. The ability to trade Bitcoin is an engagement tool uh, in a broader financial services app, which is what cash app represents. So it does certainly have a role and has some value there, but it's not really central to the investment thesis in the stock at this point in time. Jason, I want to switch gears here uh, and just get your thoughts on another name, a firm, which is reporting next week. Now, that's a different look and tape. That stock's been a monster this year, up about 80 um, percent. They report, I believe, Jason, November 8th. What's your what's your rating on a firm? We have a neutral rating on a firm, and that's really largely macro and related to credit uh, as well. 
they tend to skew from a consumer perspective more towards a lower to middle income demographic. We know that student loan repayments uh, are uh, resuming here. Unemployment has started to inch up a little bit. So the potential impact on broader consumer discretionary spending, which is a lot of what a firm's merchants are, are, are known for, um, could face a little bit of risk from that regard. With that said, the company has man managed the actual credit risk very well in terms of the uh, default risk and the delinquencies that we've seen them report. And I think when they report next week, the credit metrics will continue to be solid. And we think that there will also be uh, some updates probably on one of their newer products, which is known as the Affirm Card. But the other issue here really also is that the, the profitability of the business from an operating income and a net income uh, basis is, is, is still struggling to kind of get over the hump. All right, Jason, it'll be interesting to get those numbers appreciated and those block numbers as well. Jason Kupferberg, Senior Pan Payments Analyst at Bank of America. Appreciate it. Thank you. Let's check out some trending tickers right now. We got to start with shares of Six Flags and Cedar Fair. And that's on a report uh, from the Wall Street Journal that the two companies are considering a deal here. Um, presumably, it would be Six Flags buying Cedar Fair, but unclear exactly what this would look like. They characterize it, the journal that is, as a merger potentially. Um, Six Flags, of course, owns Six Flags. Cedar Fair owns a number of different parks across the country, including Cedar Point, which I believe is in Ohio, Dorney Park in Pennsylvania, King's Dominion. I grew up going down to King's Dominion in Virginia, um, Knott's Berry Farm, so it has a significant portfolio as well. Yeah, and I'm bringing these just a little bit up on, on Six Flags and kind of the, the change in strategy that they've had. They're sort of targeting higher-end guests now, like raised prices made over their parks. And the CEO has said it's, it's having an impact in terms of growth and attendance. Companies are, are, are roughly the same size. Market value is around $2 billion. Cedar Fair, by the way, is scheduled to report earnings tomorrow morning, I think. So maybe we get some news there on that headline. Yeah, we might just. I mean, both of these stocks, though, have been down this year. That's something to point out here. Um, even as, uh, you know, we talk about maybe these uh, companies coming to some sort of a deal. Six Flags has also been the subject of an activist campaign from Land and Buildings and Jonathan Lid, who succeeded in getting um, a representative on the board earlier this, this year. So we'll see what ends up happening in this situation. We're also watching shares of Generac, the generator maker. Of course, uh, that stock is trading higher after it reported third quarter results after revenue and adjusted earnings per share came in higher than estimates. The CEO attributing the positive results to improving operating performance. This company has had really uneven results coming out of the pandemic. Everybody in the pandemic, well, not everybody, but a lot of people bought generators, right? Um, and then the pandemic ended, and this has been one of those companies that's been a victim of lumpy demand and the normalization cycle. So this time, things looking a little bit better after it had some weakness in recent quarters. Yeah, I mean, that's a very strong pop. Look at that. You're up about 14 percent. It looks like it, they beat their adjusted EPS and net sales beat estimates. And I know analysts were specifically talking, about, I guess, about strength in commercial and industrial mm -hmm. product segments is what they're keying in on there. Right. So it's not the homeowners this time who are buying their right. generators, but rather businesses. Different areas of strength exactly. there. Exactly. All right, finally, last ticker here, shares of Paycom. They are plummeting here. Look at this. Wow, down nearly 40% It's after the company cut its revenue forecast for the fourth quarter. Third quarter revenue also missing expectations. So this one, I mean, this is a May Day. This one, this is, by the way, this, is, this was the biggest intraday fall on record, by the way. This is an employment software company. So I think the thing is, cut its full year forecast. Mm -hmm. Also, the Q3 revenue missed, at least what the, re what the street was looking for. And analysts are really busy here, downgrading their, their recommendations. Steve Full, Brad Reback, of course, well-known guy. Uh, he goes to hold, price target goes to 160, expects the first half of 2024 to be challenging. He does think the forecast is conservative. He says a lot of the ma bad news, he argues, is priced in, but he, he did slash the rating there to a hold. You know, one other analyst over at Opco said a rebound in the hiring market is unlikely to occur anytime soon. And I think Paycom is really important here because it's not just about Paycom, right? It's about the whole payroll software space and then by extension, the job market, right? We have been looking, we've got the job support on Friday. We had a JOLTS report today that showed more openings, although there are some questions over the accuracy of that, but more openings than expected. 
in the job market. So when are we going to start to see softening in the job market? The Fed is watching it, obviously, very closely. And, you know, is this one of the leading indicators? Maybe. I don't know. But it's definitely something that, uh, you know, not only people who are investing in this sector, but probably macro folks are also watching. Absolutely. See, trying to read yep. the tea leaves here um, as we await that jobs report on Friday. Yep. All right, coming up, we got the closing bell on Wall Street. Stocks are near the highs of the session as we close things out. We're gearing up for a lot of earnings after the close. Stay with us. here today. ICE uh, ringing the bell as we get the close on Wall Street. And as we take a look at the markets here, we have stocks closing near the highs of the session following uh, no increase in rates from Jay Powell and company. And then a press conference that seemed to tilt towards maybe the Fed being done. At least that seems to be the interpretation of Jay Powell's commentary. The Nasdaq, uh, the winner on the day, up 1.6%, and the S&P up a little more than 1%, and the Dow up two-thirds of 1%. Take a quick look at the uh, Yahoo Finance Interactive here, and you see the intraday chart of the Nasdaq in particular to start there, and seeing really that jump during the press conference, and then kind of continuing upwards from there. The Nasdaq 100 movers on the day, all of the sort of biggies, the Magnificent 7 or 8, however we're counting it these days, all of them showing pretty substantial gains on the day as we saw risk on, as our Jared Blickery put it earlier in the day. Uh, not all of the groups in the uh, S&P up, uh, but we did have the sort of risk groups like tech, communication services, com consumer discretionary, rising the most energy and consumer staples, though falling a little bit back on the day. And a quick look here as well at what we saw in yields today, because obviously that's important when we're looking at what's going on uh, with the Fed. The 10-year note falling, the yield falling, about 4.79% is where things ended up on that front. So 
Um, interesting day, interesting press conference, even if there wasn't a lot of suspense, but interesting interpretation of it when all was said and done here. Um, of course, we are now going to switch gears and look at earnings that are coming out uh, right now. And we would like to start with Qualcomm. That company uh, coming out with its numbers in the past few moments here. Uh, Qualcomm's fourth quarter earnings beating estimates, $2.02 a share. The estimate was a buck ninety-two. Revenue eight point six seven billion dollars. That too is ahead of estimates. And looky here, a forecast above estimates. We have not seen as many of those from big tech this season necessarily. First quarter adjusted earnings per share two twenty-five to two forty-five. Analysts had been estimating two dollars and twenty-five cents. So uh, it is leaving itself some room to wow. beat estimates here. Uh, Qualcomm shares up by about five, uh, four percent. It's the biggest seller of smartphone chips. But as we talked about with the CEO Cristiano uh, Amon last week, um, the company is also trying to push into faster um, CPUs that potentially will go into PCs as well. Yeah, I mean it's interesting. This this stock had been heading into the sprint a whole bunch of nothing this mm. year. One big reason for that though was the smartphone market. So it'll be very interesting to hear the executives on the call talk about that market. Is it bottoming? And importantly, what do they see ahead in 2024? That'll be key to your point, Julie. The product portfolio is also going to be in focus right there. We did have the CEO come on talk about that new PC chip. He's talking very tough, saying, hey, he can outperform Apple. He can outperform Intel. Bernstein saying, in terms of that product portfolio, it is the best it has ever been. That's what Stacey Rasgon said. Very interesting. Yeah, it is. So, and then, and turning ahead, and to your point as well, listen, it's not just smartphones. They're in autos. They're in IoT. And I think those two business lines will also be really interesting. What are they seeing in, ahead in 2024, just given the macro headwinds we're talking about? Well, I can tell you what they saw in the third quarter. Handset-related sales were down 27% to about $5.5 billion. I, uh, internet connected devices down 31%. That was the sales down 31% to about $1.4 billion. Auto sales were the bright spot, but this is the smallest part of the business, right? Auto sales up 15% to $535 million. So a couple of questions then surrounding that. First of all, the company has been trying to diversify to some extent away from the handset chips, away from smartphone sure. chips. Um, and it has looked to autos, as so many of the chip makers have, as a growth area. So indeed, it did see growth there that mitigated some of the declines. What does the forecast imply? And this is really going to be key on the call. What does Qualcomm's forecast imply about the demand for smartphones? Are we starting to see a turn in a, a reacceleration in demand for smartphones um, going into the holiday season, going into the fourth quarter? Is that what that sales forecast means? We'll probably have to wait for the uh, conference call. Yeah, I'm just I'm looking through the segments as well. So QCT, that's that core chipset business. It looks like revenues there were seven point let's call it three seven billion, and then QTL, that's the licensing business. It looks like those came in around one point two six billion. But clearly investors like what they see. Yes, indeed. All right, let us move to another company that we're watching closely here. Airbnb just out with this numbers as well. Now those shares are down by three and a half percent. Let's run it through it here quickly. Airbnb uh, beat on a number of metrics going looking backwards at the third quarter. It looks like it is the fourth quarter forecast that is responsible for the drop in the shares. But let's tell you about the third quarter first. Uh, the revenue there rose by 18 percent in the third quarter and came in ahead of estimates at about $3.4 billion. Gross bookings uh, rose by 17% to $18.3 billion. And the company's EBITDA was ahead of estimates at $1.8 billion. Also closely watched the Nights and Experiences book. The number of Nights and Experiences booked, 113.2 million. All of these numbers were ahead of estimates. But what about the outlook? The, for the fourth quarter, the company says revenue will be $2.13 to $2.17 billion. Analysts, on average, have been looking for $2.18 billion. So yes, obviously that's a disappointment there. leaves some room yep. for them to miss estimates. And they talked, Josh, in the statement a little bit about what they see in the fourth quarter. A little yeah, color. Yeah, they, they do mention volatility, specifically saying we are seeing greater volatility early in Q4 and are closely monitoring macroeconomic trends and geopolitical conflicts that may impact travel demand. 
Uh, so we, and they go on to say, we currently expect our Knights book growth in Q4 to moderate relative to Q3. And you can see the reaction there in the after hours. Yeah, the company does say that for profitability, that they expect adjusted EBITDA for the fourth quarter to be a record on a nominal basis and margin that goes up year over year. So that's one thing they're trying to emphasize as a little bit more positive here. But again, as we try to read the tea leaves, of what is happening in the broader economy, right? Are we starting to see weakening from this hot, hot period of travel demand? Is that what this is telling us? Again, I think we'll have to look to the conference call to get a little bit more color on that. Um, but that is, I think, a question that looms over, not just Airbnb, but the airlines, the hotel companies. No, I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's a great, it's a great read on the consumer. Like you right. get, you get this real, this real look at the consumer. What is travel demand yes. going to look like in the months ahead? Given all these storm clouds that we're talking about all the time with strategies right. and economy. So interesting. When I ha had my conversation with the Royal Caribbean CEO Jason Liberty last week, he is not seeing those storm clouds. He emphasized that he is catering to a higher end customer, and cruisers are devoted folks. Um, and they are booking out far in advance. So our, you know, again, like everything else, it's sort of lumpy, sort of uneven. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. All right, Qualcomm beating estimates in the stock we were just talking about. That is higher after hours. Here to dig into Qualcomm's fourth quarter results, we have Angelo Zeno, CFRA Research Senior Equity Analyst. So, and Angelo, let me first just get your reaction to the print. What did you make of it? I thought the numbers were good. I mean, in terms of the actual results uh, coming in slightly better than expected, and the guidance was also uh, pretty good. I think this pretty much kind of confirms that we're essentially at least at some sort of bottom for, um, you know, in, in terms of Qualcomm's, um, you know, revenue trajectory here, whether it be just seasonal in nature, whether it's sustainable or not, I think is, is the question. But as far as kind of the declines on the handset side of things. You know, we've definitely been under shipping true end demand here for several quarters, as bad as end demand has been. Um, the, you know, the, the sell in has been even worse. So um, we're actually finding a bottom here. And again, whether or not it's just seasonal in nature, I think remains to be seen, but definitely a good sign for Qualcomm at the moment. Are we seeing a bottom in everything? <laughs> not everything, I'm exaggerating. But Angela, are we seeing a bottom in smartphones? maybe in PCs too, which we know they're trying to push further into in Internet of Things, like across some of the different business lines, should we look for that? Yeah, I think that's a good question, and I think the answer is no. Um, so when you kind of look at the, the semiconductor market right now, it's very bifurcated in nature, right? I mean, we've kind of seen a very big drawdown in terms of inventories on the more consumer you know, oriented areas of the market, like PCs and smartphones, to your point. We've kind of seen a bottoming on, and on that front here over the last quarter or two. And I think that's a good sign for the likes of a Qualcomm, you know, as far as smartphones are concerned, whether it be an AMD with, with their results last night or even like an Intel that we saw last week. I think those type of names are kind of finding a bottoming in terms of their revenue base. But, you know, when we start thinking about other type of markets like automotive and industrials, there are definitely a lot more challenges or ch uh, kind of a downturn that we're starting to see accelerating in those end markets. And we'll, it'll be interesting to kind of see the type of commentary that Qualcomm provides here um, at, as far as the December quarter is concerned about their automotive and Internet of Things business, because my guess is they've got to be so seeing some sort of weakness typical to what we've seen some, with some of the other chip makers out there. And Angela, we, we did have, you know, the company came out, um, unveiled that new PC chip, and we had the CEO on Yahoo Finance. He was talking very tough there about, listen, he can, he can outperform Apple, he can outperform Intel. Maybe not near term, but let's say intermediate, long term. Do you see that as a tailwind for the company? Listen, I think it's an opportunity for them. I mean, whether it be getting into to PCs or other uh, markets where they're not really deeply entrenched in, I think it's definitely an opportunity where there is kind of new revenue opportunities for them. Now, that being said, um, you kind of look at what Intel has said about kind of ARM-based chips into the PC market. They don't necessarily uh, believe it. But when you think about what Apple has done on the ARM-based side of things, dumping Intel and how successful they've been kind of taking share here over the last two to three years, 
um, it's been pretty impressive. Now, Apple, of course, is Apple. And when you kind of look at you know, how far they've pushed the limits in terms of their um, M3 uh, silicon chip that they just launched this week, kind of based on three nanometer technology, it is still ahead, we think, of the Qualcomm's of the world, which just kind of launched you know, based on their four nanometer technology. But that said, um, it is absolutely an opportunity for Qualcomm. It's also going to be an opportunity for a name like NVIDIA, which probably gets into the CPU PC market in 2025. So there are going to be other opp opportunities out there for companies that haven't that have essentially that haven't had the opportunity on the PC side of things because it has been dominated by x86 ar architecture, specifically by um, Intel. So an opportunity, whether or not it, it transitions too much, I think, again, remains to be seen and probably is going to take a couple of years before you see notable kind of revenue potential. Angelo, you mentioned Apple, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask about it. I mean, obviously Qualcomm is a little bit of an unusual indicator when it comes to Apple because it's both a, you know, a client of and competitor to at this stage. Um, but what's the read through, if any, from Qualcomm to what we're going to hear from Apple? I wouldn't read through too much into it. I mean, we, we've kind of learned that in the past, right? I mean, you kind of look at uh, just the last quarter results and uh, Qualcomm took a big beating and, and you know, Apple actually did fairly well. So I don't know if I'd look too much into it, but that said, um, you know, I do think kind of you're seeing a stabilization in terms of the broader smartphone market out there. Um, they're probably going to see some challenges, you know, clearly on the China side of things. And we clearly want to know a lot about what Apple has to say about China tomorrow night. But nonetheless, I mean, it's a good sign that the broader market in terms of smartphones is stabilizing. It'll be important to see what Qualcomm on this call has to say, if anything, about the Android versus kind of the iOS ecosystem out there. My guess is some of the uplift or a good amount of the uplift is coming on the Android side of things because it's been so beaten down. But nonetheless, I, I think, you know, it's definitely promising to see a stabilization um, within the smartphone side of things. Angelo Zeno, thank you so much for joining us for that time and insight, Angelo. Appreciate it. Great, thanks, Batman. And coming up, we're minutes away from PayPal's third quarter earnings results. We're going to break the numbers down and bring you in-depth analysis. That's after the break.
Goldman Sachs analysts and top executives from across the technology, media and telecoms landscape are gathered in San Francisco for its annual Communicopia and Technology Conference. Next door is doing some pretty cool things on the AI front with their assistant and also with Vitality. For us, it actually starts to unleash unique data. We are the local knowledge graph, so I think the value of what we do starts to really shine forth. We're the only platform where you're finding out what's going on around you locally in real time. So with that data, we can do things like on the platform, help a neighbor compose a post in a way that is more engaging. So the assistant or the AI actually does that for you. There's lots of interesting discussion we can have around AI. So we announced just this morning, uh, Zoom AI Companion which is our answer to how generative AI is going to be included in our platform. And there's all kinds of really cool features that come with that for our paid subscribers. There are things like Chat Compose, if you're in a chat thread and you want to be able to respond to that. There are things like Meeting Summaries, which after the fact help categorize and, and capture not only what happened in the meeting, but also the true sentiment. I think any creative would admit that AI is transformative to how they think about and how they concept new ideas. So I think it's gonna be very exciting. It's still early innings and we gotta figure out how to do it right. There's a lot of hype in our industry. I think this may be underhyped. I think it impacts things at so many levels. It impacts how we interact with computers and how they seem personal. It generates how art and media is created. It, it's a really a breakthrough in computer science and it impacts not only the products, but it impacts how software is created. There certainly needs to be a lot of debate about AI and journalism. 57% of newsroom jobs in the United States have been lost. We're facing uh, another wave, in this case a tsunami potentially of job losses uh, because of the impact of AI. And, and these are not ju just jobs lost, but it's insight lost. It's important that all media companies uh, understand the impact, but also it's incumbent on the big AI players to understand their impact. We launched Intuit Assist. Uh, and Intuit Assist is really a personalized, intelligent uh, assistant in your pocket. Uh, it's also uh, powered by AI-driven human experts uh, so that when you are getting assistance from Intuit Assist, if you ever need to talk to an expert, no matter what it is that you're doing, you're able to do that. So there's always a gateway uh, to help. AI is gonna change this whole industry completely. And so we're thinking a lot about how do we use AI to match people a lot better, um, and to support the conversations that are happening. I think conversational AI is also a big opportunity because people do produce all these messages. So helping them craft those messages, make it easier to communicate, I think is, is something people will really appreciate as well. PayPal out with its numbers and the shares popping about 1.6%. They've been fluctuating a little bit after the numbers here. Let's just run through them quickly for you. Earnings per share coming in at a buck 30. That is seven cents ahead of estimates. And the company's total payment volume for the third quarter, $387.7 billion. That is about $3 billion ahead of estimates. On the flip side, the company, if you look at its earnings per share forecast, fourth quarter earnings per share, going to be about a buck 36 the company says the estimate was for a dollar 40 so some room for it to potentially miss forecast there in other news the management changes continue at the company jamie miller has been appointed the cfo of the company she most recently was the global cfo at ey remember the company recently got alex chris as its new president and ceo and with the shares down uh what about 27 percent or so this year uh, investors are certainly looking for some kind of a course correction at the company, Josh. Yeah, and in, in after hours, your shares are sort of moving all over the place. Initially, yeah. they had a nice pop. They yes. were about, about 3%. Well, I think that was before those forecast headlines perhaps Yeah, that, came now we're, we're, sink, we're back, down, back basically to the flat line here. I think, listen, a, a great read here on consumer spending, what it looks like now and in the months ahead. That'll be interesting, uh, what PayPal execs are seeing. Obviously, you know, consumers entered this new period of higher rates with solid cash levels, but we know they're you know, slowly but surely eating through those. The, new, the change in the C-suite, too, are really interesting. Mm -hmm. Alex Chris is there. 
um, what are his priorities? What does he want to emphasize? Or at least what does he think, what do investors hope that he, that, yeah. he, that they want to see? And analysts too, which I know we have a smart one coming up here. Yes, we do. And there's a lot of competition in this industry too. Just one more number that I just want to mention for folks to be aware of, and that's the fourth quarter revenue forecast as well. The company says at current spot rates, at current currency rates, that revenue in the fourth quarter will rise six to seven percent. Analysts have been looking for more like an eight percent gain. So there too, perhaps a little bit of disappoint, uh, disappointment. Let's bring in Moshe Katri, who is managing director at Wedbush, to dig a little bit more into these uh, numbers here. So first blush, what is sort of your impression here of, of what we're hearing from PayPal? Probably uh, consistent with what we've seen in the prior quarters. Uh, revenue's probably a bit better than expected. TPV looks okay. Um, the major issues that have been actually impacting the stock, uh, there are really two, three. Uh, and I think you're, you you can probably see them in the numbers right now. One is the margin compression that you've seen, especially coming in from their uh, Braintree, which is a merchant processing platform that caters to large enterprises. Uh, that's doing really well, but it has lower yield and it's impacting margin. So that's number one. Uh, number two, competitive uh, um, competitive pressures or concerns regarding competitive pressures, mainly from the likes of Apple Pay and IDN. Um, and then lastly, what's going on with e-commerce trends, and they've been normalizing from pre-pandemic levels where we've seen growth uh, exceeding 20%, and now we're kind of, we started the year with low single digits, and now we're kind of somewhere between that 5 to 10% level. So all that is is still kind of here, and obviously what we, uh, hopefully, what we'll hear from the new CEO is what he is planning to do in terms of monetizing this tremendous asset that PayPal has on both sides of the platform. Uh, you know, they cater to 30 million plus merchants. And then on the other hand, they cater to about half a billion uh, consumers. And they, we just need to do a better job on monetizing both pro, uh, uh, fronts of the platform at PayPal. And Moshe, you mentioned the new CEO, Alex Chris. Um, in your opinion, what, should, what are his priorities and what do you think his priorities should be? Yep. He has a great background on uh, monetizing the SMB space. Um, so in my view, that's probably going to be one of those areas where they're going to expand on the merchant side of the business. Uh, and on top of that, typically the yields uh, th that are related to the SMB space are much higher versus the yields that are related to the large enterprise space. So that it could actually be a margin um, that would leave, uh, could be a creative from a margin perspective down the road, and that could also help um, uh, you know accelerate revenue growth down the road as well. I think that's going to be the probably the immediate part of what he's going to do down the road uh, on the monetization front. What what about um, the competitive landscape right now when it comes to PayPal? I mean, how do you think they're holding up? Obviously. Investors have not been too happy with their performance as we've seen year to date. The stock has gone down. Um, what do you think PayPal needs to do to sort of uh, compete better in this landscape? Uh, as I said, I'm going to keep on stressing that word monetization. Um, this is probably one of the most underutilized assets in the space. Uh, on the merchant side, they have a very sticky model. Uh, they have one of the largest conversion rates in the industry for merchants. So merchants love the platform. So your, you know, your challenge is going to be creating this ecosystem of, of products and services that you can cross sell into that platform, include basically expand revenue per unit, revenue per user, and and do the same thing on the other side, on the other side of the platform, which is which caters to consumers. Build a digital app that where you can also sell products and services into roughly four or five hundred million consumers. And again, um, the great thing about this is that they have that user base and they're just waiting and craving for that ecosystem on both sides. And, and if they do a good job, you can actually accelerate growth, get better margins down the road. And Moshe, you know, there's been this boom of interest in, a, in AI. Has PayPal talked about, you know, integrating chat GBT or generative AI more broadly into the business? Gen AI is being used in payments in general just to combat uh, issues such as fraud, 
um, such as monetization uh, on a data part of the business, but it's definitely been used by most players, most players in the industry, including PayPal. Mosh Katri, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Coming up, Zillow out with Q3 results. We're going to bring you the numbers and talk about the stock's recent dive, etc. A judge's ruling on real estate brokerage commissions. That is coming up next. Zillow is out with its third quarter results, the company topping estimates on the top and bottom line. Shares are under pressure, though, in after hours trading right now. They're down some 4 percent. And uh, that, by the way, uh, is after a 15 percent gain in the shares this year. But definitely it has been a volatile year for Zillow. Let's run through some of the numbers here. Revenue of $496 million did beat the average analyst estimate. Um, and if you look at here, the website traffic for the company, more than 2.6 billion visits to Zillow's sites and apps in the quarter, was down about 5% from the same period last year. I know you and I uh, are people who have looked at Zillow. So I spent too much time on year. Zillow. You know what the favorite thing to do is on Zillow? You plug in the, the amount of money you would spend, for example, in the tri-state area into another area of the country. That's just a sick oh, game. Why I play would with you my, do that? I don't, know, I don't know why I do it. It's not even fun. Oh. It puts me in a bad mood, and yet I can't stop doing it. It's a weird addiction. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. Um, we also had, of course, under scrutiny because this Missouri jury decided, we had that, those headlines, this Missouri, a jury decided that the National Association of Realtors colluded uh, to keep agent commissions artificially high. Right. Now, in a letter to shareholders, we should mention CEO of Zillow, Rich, Rich Barton, said the company could thrive even given a complete disruption to the existence of buyer's agents and said apparently he views the scenario as unlikely. It would not, in his opinion, be good news for consumers, but he said it, it may lead to, in his words, a larger and more profitable business model for Zillow. Yeah, so if you look at the company's core business of connecting um, people who are looking for homes with real estate agents, that core business revenue there down 3% from $362 million, 
that is sort of a smaller decline than in the broader industry in the number of, re, of transactions. So to put that sort of in perspective there. But um, there are a lot of questions about that recent ruling, about some other outstanding cases that are similar, what effect they're going to have on the brokers, on Zillow, on the broader industry, what the timeline is. So it's a confusing time for those who are buying a house, those who are investing in these companies, as we look at some of those uh, recent rulings and even as we look at these numbers. All right, let's talk more about this. A challenging real estate market may be getting even trickier now. A jury, as we were just discussing, finding residential brokerages liable for keeping commissions high, awarding nearly $1.8 billion in damages in the case. For more on what this means for the battered real estate industry, we have Housing Wire lead analyst Logan Motoshami, along with Ryan Tomasello, KBW Managing Director. So, Ryan, let me start with you. Just these headlines we got yesterday certainly caused some very rapid, in some cases, dramatic moves uh, from this jury in Missouri. What, what did you make of those headlines and what it means for, for the universe of stocks you cover? Yeah, thanks for having me. I think for us, it wasn't uh, a surprising announcement. This has been a storyline that has been unfolding for the last several years. Um, you know, the, the issue at hand here is how commissions are set and paid. And we think that the writing is on the wall around the scrutiny that the industry is currently, currently facing, um, that ultimately that structure is going to change. And the ruling we got yesterday aligns with that thesis that ultimately these this scrutiny is going to reshape the housing structure as we know it. Um, and Logan, so how is it going to reshape? I, I think we're all trying to figure out what this ruling means, how long it's going to take for anything to change. What do we know right now in the wake of it? Well, we're going to see a lot more lawsuits come into play, and that's probably going to confuse people even more. But, you know, the days of buyers actually getting a free ride into buying a home because uh, the seller would actually pay their cost is over. Uh, in a sense, but you have to ask, you have to look at the Zillows and the Redfins. If there's going to be less income made by the real estate industry, which is already in a recession because existing home sales are low, does that impact their business in the future going out? Or does a Zillow and a Redfin find a way to uh, establish kind of a new marketplace where they can be the facilitator to buyers going into the marketplace? So right now it's a very unknown but the headlines are going to be about the lawsuits coming out. Until you get some clarity and cost there, uh, this will be a cloud around the real estate uh, industry. And then after that, we'll see what happens when new regulations come in and how the, the sector will operate with those new rules. And Ryan, uh, Logan brings up a good point. You know, it's a lawsuit. There's going to be an appeal. This will go on for years. We know this. But I mean, I do think investors are already beginning to think about risks, long term investors at least. Are there certain business models that would be more at risk if this really becomes law? Yeah, I mean, we've called out a few different types of business models as being beneficiaries and potentially at risk from how this could play out. I mean, the most obvious players who are at the epicenter of this scrutiny are the players that are directly tied to that commission pool that we think could see significant pressure upwards of potentially 30 percent over time. So that involves, you know, the traditional residential brokerages, but also you have players that whose business models are directly tied to that commission pool in other ways, which would include some of the legacy uh, first generation lead generation portals uh, like a Zillow or Realtor.com, um, whose revenue models are directly tied to the buy side agent commission. Um, you know, on the flip side of that, we think that one uh, interesting story that could uh, be a significant beneficiary from all of this chaos and restructuring is CoStar, uh, which is a dominant player in the commercial and multifamily markets, but has been expanding very rapidly into the residential for sale market. They have a, a new brand that they've been investing hundreds of millions of dollars behind called Homes.com. That is really the only portal out there today of scale that is exclusively focused on advertising homes and providing digital advertising services for listing agents. In a new world where home sellers are no longer incentivized to compensate buyers agents, you know, you could argue that they have a lot more flexibility to reallocate that advertising spend, which is otherwise known as the buyer agent commission to these other models. So CoStar, we think is set up well to benefit from the unlocking of that significantly under monetized um, advertising TAM for housing in the US. Ryan, 
how quickly or easily would some of the other players be able to pivot in that direction? I mean, look, there's some great brands out there in the market. Um, consumer eyeballs are ultimately the ones that drive the success of these businesses. Um, you know, brands like Zillow and Realtor.com certainly can leverage those brands to continue to, to operate in a new market structure. Um, I think there's some question around the, uh, the swiftness with which those business models can pivot and the risk that a pivot poses to the existing revenue streams, which in certain cases could be cannibalized as these companies try to stand up an alternative type of advertising model that can thrive in this new market. So that will take time um, and it will really depend on you know, how quickly these management teams uh, decide to respond to uh, this new structure. And Logan, I'm, I'm also thinking a settlement could still be a possibility. Is there a settlement that you think could make all the parties happy here? Probably not make all the parties happy, but, but for me, what I'm looking forward uh, in the next year or two is can a Zillow or a Redfin or a Realtor.com facilitate a kind of a low fee for the buyer to provide the services for them to be part of the negotiation? And will regulations allow that to be kind of tied into the mortgages to make it a little bit more fluid situation? Right now, there's just so many questions out with the lawsuits and who's going to get impacted or who's going to make a deal. But looking ahead, there's opportunity here for somebody to step up. And of course, while all the chaos is going in, uh, to me right now, the, the people that are putting plan uh, their game plan into motion will benefit in about a year or two. Logan, and just quickly, are consumers ultimately going to benefit from this? Are they going to be paying less of, as a result of this? Well, I, I, if you're a seller, you're obviously going to be paying less. As a buyer, the kind of free ride is over. Uh, uh, you are always getting uh, your, your, your payment uh, paid by the seller. So that's gone. So uh, the consumer will get hit on the buyer side. On the seller side, of course, you're going to keep more of your... Uh, uh, what you sell your house for after uh, after the mortgage is paid off. Logan Manashami and Ryan Tomasello, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. And Elf Beauty out with its second quarter results. The company topping estimates on the top and bottom line and raises its full year guidance again, Julie. Fun fact. Yes. They prefer the, and I've forgotten about this when we talked about it yesterday, they prefer ELF because it stands for eyes, oh, I, lips, <laughs> face. That does, Did you know that this? Does, that does we ring tend, better. Like, like, yeah. like uh, the inclination it. is to say it ELF because sense. that's, uh, but I think they like ELF. Anyway, makeup is still going. Make, you know, we talked about this a little bit yesterday that there was some Nielsen data that threw into question just how strong the momentum was of the company. And then it comes out and raises its forecast here. Uh, Tarang Amin, who is the CEO of the company, talked about exceptional, consistent, category-leading uh, sales growth here. ELF is on uh, the lower end of the spectrum when it comes to cost uh, associated with beauty. So that might be uh, speak to the sustainability here of its appeal. You know, you can especially contrast this, I think, with what we heard from Estee Lauder earlier today, which owns sort of mid to higher range brands, right? It owns Mac, it owns a Tom Ford here and has been affected more by travel, travelers who would buy that kind of makeup. So it's just interesting that as we ta have talked about, the makeup is viewed as something that is has consistent demand and yet when you look at the different companies within the space, you see very different stories from an ELF versus something like an Estee Lauder. Yeah, and Estee Lauder was interesting too to me just because of what they were seeing sort of regionally, geographically, how they mm -hmm. talked about America's, it was a, kind of a more positive tone there in terms of picking up, but then when they talked about mainland China, yeah. that was more pessim that was more, more pessimistic, more, more about how, listen, people just aren't coming back or they're at least coming back more slowly than maybe we thought. Yeah, and just to draw a contrast here between the two companies, um, ELF gets the bulk of its sales from the United States. So more than 80% of uh, ELF sales come from the U.S., whereas if you look at an Estee Lauder, as you say, it's much more an international company. Um, it only gets, uh, I'm looking at the Americas, around a quarter to a third of its sales from the Americas overall. So much more diversified geographically, uh, and it looks like Elf's reliance on the U.S., at least for now, 
is another area of strength, another yeah. source of strength, perhaps. Well, coming up, we're going to go around the horn with some of today's recent earnings reports. That's coming up next. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Alexandra Canal here with Josh Schaefer and Praz Subramanian. And we have a slew of earnings that we want to get to, but I first want to kick things off with Roku. Roku shares are jumping today, and it really all has to do with guidance and th that guidance coming in greater than expected. If we take a look at the numbers here, uh, for the fourth quarter, Roku sees adjusted EBITDA of 10 million compared to the expected loss of 57.6 million. That's according to Bloomberg consensus estimates. So that's really a big driver in the rally that we're seeing in shares right now. The company also sees net revenue of $955 million, also higher than expectations with gross profit of $405 million. So a positive outlook for Roku. And we know that a lot of these earnings, that's ultimately what investors want to see. But digging into the prior quarter, we did see net revenue uh, up 20% year over year on a net loss of $330.1 million. Now, this was a wider loss compared to the prior year period. But we did see platform revenue um, along with streaming hours and active accounts come in higher there. So overall, very strong quarter for Roku. They're really a barometer as well for the ad environment. And they say, although the ad market continued to be challenged in the third quarter, they were able to see some benefits at the end of the day. And that's because they have a lot of diversification, which analysts have called out as well. But again, a 15% pop in shares right now after hours. Yeah, you know, look, that stock was down a lot this year, uh, bouncing really high here. A couple of things I want to call to you. you. You mentioned a lot of good guy and stuff there, but like, you know, platform revenue up 17%, mm -hmm. gross profit up 22%, uh, active accounts up by 2.3 million, streaming hours up almost 5 billion hours, right, yeah. in a quarter. I mean, those are some big numbers there. It, it, it seemed that Roku had sort of hit some speed bumps, was growth is slowing down. How many boxes can they sell? They're kind of on the cheaper side. How many more people can they actually sort of get back into the, their ecosystem? And I guess it's still happening. Yeah, and I think, Pross, you made a good point about shares being down a lot. And then you take a look at shares over the last month, they were down about 15%. And when you just think about sort of the market sentiment to end the day coming into earnings here, we've seen stocks really not move that positively on positive earnings that people have been worried about. Mm -hmm. Fed higher for longer, rising yields. Well, guess what? To end, end the day today, to end Fed Day, we saw yields, yields fall, right? And we have overall market sentiment being a little bit risk on into the close. I think that sort of helps Roku and helps some of these non-profitable tech companies mm -hmm. when you think about just investors being ready to pile back in. Mm -hmm. It has not been a moment over the last month where people are buying unprofitable tech companies. So I think if you're Roku, a little bit happy, 
a little bit lucky, but it's not a bad day to report earnings. Hey, anything 43 about. million adjusted EBITDA. You can't, you can't beat that, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, like, it, 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 we were just showing, just I mean, they reported a wider adjusted. than expected loss. Yeah. You would think that would drive yeah. shares down, but again, it all has to go with that guidance. That's really what investors want. Yeah. Um, you know, what do you think about the fact that, well, I know there's some other deals happening in the streaming world, but with mm -hmm. Roku in particular, is it, is it sort of gaining popularity in that space? Are people actually using it for streaming Roku's own sort of content? They are trying to get more into original content. We had that Weird yeah. Al movie that they came out with. So they're they're trying to dive in a little bit more to Roku originals. But they're also, you know, in that connected TV market. Mm -hmm. They have a lot of different touch points that they can rely on if other parts of their business aren't doing so hot. So analysts overall have been, have been pretty bullish on this stock. They've restructured. They've done some layoffs. So so they're they're working hard and clearly that's reflected in the guidance. I love the product. You guys use the product? Yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it's it. super convenient super to be easy. able to plug into a smart TV and obviously they've been making hardware now too with the actual TVs themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's something that's just been impressive to be able to move into that hardware space process and sort of yeah. pull that next lever, right? Get that next Always round of revenue lever. in from selling, those, selling that hardware. <laughs> Push one of those Netflix direct buttons on that Roku yeah. box. Uh, speaking of stocks that are up today, I'm watching Toyota. Uh, the ADR shares listed in the U.S. today popping almost 6%. This is the after hours, They're not doing after hours. So it's gone. Good day today in the, in this, the, the regular session here. Uh, they boosted their guidance here, both sales and, uh, sorry, revenue and profit guidance here. Uh, you know, really strong numbers here for Toyota, given the fact that its rivals like Ford and GM had pulled their guidance, not doing so hot there. Uh, one thing I want to note, though, is that Toyota has, has sort of said that they've kept their delivery guidance for their full year delivery guidance of 11.4 million units, but they're saying that there's a switch there with EVs, 40% less EVs they see sold in 2020, fiscal year 2024, uh, but that number will be compensated with by hybrids. They think that hybrid sales are going to be stronger at the end of the year globally, and we're, I guess, again, reflecting the EV sort of not so hot these days. Companies thought that they were going to be selling a lot more EVs than they, than they actually are, and actually hybrids are the ones that are more popular. And it's interesting, Rick Newman just mentioned this in a column the other day that was up on our website, and it was a great point out, just is that move now going to be, is hybrid sort of like the gateway car to get people mm -hmm. into EVs, right, and do those become mm -hmm. more popular? And when you think hybrid, don't you think Toyota Prius? That's what I think. Wasn't that the initial hybrid, Toyota right? Go, going back hybrid. for 25 years. Yeah. yeah. Toyota has been well positioned in that market. So it's interesting to think as we talk about, you know, maybe EV demand isn't exactly where it was. Yeah. Well, the OG hybrid car company might benefit from that if people want they to. Never be able wanted, to get they both. never wanted to go EVs. Wow, interesting. They yeah. never they wanted to stick with their hybrid model. They were sort of convinced that we make these we do these things well, cheaply, people want them. Why should we go better? Yeah, I mean, that makes sense to me. I feel like hybrid is the perfect way to, mm -hmm. to get a little bit of the EV benefit while also not having to worry about some of the things that we know consumers are worried about, like infrastructure mm -hmm. and pricing, for example. And, you know, the EV slowdown is something we've heard from a lot of these car makers. You wonder how will, that will play out in 2024 and beyond. Well, it's funny with Toyota in particular because they were so cautious and then they and then and they actually had to replace their CEO. Their Akio Toyota became the chairman. They, had, they, they brought the Lexus guy to do EVs. And it turns out Akio was, Akio San was right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, maybe we're not ready for EVs just quite yet. It's going to happen, right. not right now. Now, what if you took your EV and went to the Cheesecake Factory process? I've cheesecake. got another earnings story for us that I want to check out. If we can take a look at Cheesecake, fact, cheesecake Factory shares after hours, sliding a bit on two key mm. numbers here. So adjusted EPS for the quarter coming in at 39 cents. The street have been hoping for 43 cents. So a slight miss there. And then another big call out here would be comparable restaurant sales. That's obviously one of those key numbers we always think about in terms of restaurant. So sales were up 2.4% in those comparable restaurants, but the street have wanted 3.7%. So a little bit of a miss there. I think the overall thing you probably want to hear on this Cheesecake Factory earnings call is just consumer demand. Are people still continuing to come in? Are they trading down on that menu at all? We heard that a little bit from some of the food companies. And then Ozempic, right? Mm -hmm. It's the number one mentioned thing on earnings calls this, this quarter as far as things that are coming up now that weren't yeah. coming up before. How does that impact someone like Cheesecake Factory? I was reading through um, some Wall Street research today. It was interesting to think about this menu as a whole because Cheesecake Factory has an expansive menu. Yes. They have a lot of gluttonous food that we all enjoy. Like Their the salads cheesecake. are literally 2,000 calories. But they also do have healthy sides <laughs> of the menu. So it'll be interesting to see if management brings up that. When you think about the big menu, yeah. you yeah. can make healthy choices on a bigger menu too.
That's true. And I do think we could possibly sh see shares reverse depending on what the commentary is in the earnings call. Because at the end of the day, we still saw positive same store sale growth both mm -hmm. year over year and compared to 2019 as well. So that's encouraging. But any sign on, on what the consumer is doing, those consumer behavior shifts, patterns, anything like that, I think will be important on the call. Yeah, yeah I'm, kind of, I'm kind of curious about how, are we seeing, you said shifting down in sort of things that they're ordering. Mm. Are we seeing, not just shift down, but people lead, not going to Cheesecake Factory, it's a little bit, a little bit pricey compared to the sure. It is, it's in, in more elevated, world, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. Would you, are they going to like the Applebee's of the world, the, uh, the Brinker restaurants, whatever those are, you know, <laughs> you know, because I, I, I might go there, but I don't Chili's. know. Uh, Chili's, yes, yes. exactly. Are, are, are we seeing those restaurants, are they seeing the Cheesecake Factory sort of uh, people go down, a little bit down market to those areas because cheesecake is a little bit, a little bit pricey. Yeah. Yeah, cheesecake ain't cheap. Something to think about as we go get some Cajun chicken littles at Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> I'm always in. We got to go get some of those. You'll have more Yahoo Finance Live on the other side. It is closing time here at Yahoo Finance. Here's a look at some top stories of the day. Disney acquiring Comcast, 33% stake in Hulu, in a move that was widely expected. The deal gives Disney full control of Hulu. Disney said it expects to pay Comcast NBC Universal about $8.61 billion by December 1st, but that price could change depending on an appraisal. They expect the deal to be completed by next year. And sticking with streaming, Netflix issuing an update on its ad tier. The company is saying its ad tier has 15 million active users per month. That is three times its May user count. And it's been a year since Netflix, Netflix launched that ad tier. The news driving those shares higher on the day. Also check out shares of DoorDash. The stock jumping on results after hours. Order surging in the third quarter, helping the company narrow its losses, and revenue also coming in above expectations. Separately, the company is warning customers who don't tip that they may face a longer wait for their food orders. Hmm. 
And here's what to watch on Thursday. Apple earnings are the big ticket item of the day, reporting after the bell. After what has been a mixed bag of results so far from U.S. tech giants, company's iPhone competition in China will give investors a glimpse of the global consumer spending, in addition to insight around Apple's services business. Earnings will come just days after CEO Tim Cook unveiled its latest MacBook Pro lineup, which bulls hope will boost softening demand. We'll also get earnings from Eli Lilly tomorrow, which comes as the stock has more than tripled in the last three years following the success and popularity of its weight loss and diabetes drug, Lunjaro. Investors will also want to hear more about how it is being developed and tested for use by children and the impact of how knockoff products are affecting sales. And we'll also hear from Paramount, the second of the big streaming companies following Netflix, which recorded a strong third quarter and announced it will raise prices. On the economic side, we're going to get initial jobless claims in the morning. It's ahead, of course, of the big jobs report on Friday. And finally, tonight, right here at 6 p.m. Eastern, Yahoo Finance Executive Director Brian Sazi is sitting down with J.P. Morgan Chase's Jamie Dimon. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. That'll be fun. You'll be here as well afterwards we'll to chat a little bit about it. That's going to do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live, except not really today because Jamie Dimon is coming up. A little extra. It continues. Yahoo, yeah. Yahoo Finance Live Extra is coming your way. I will not be here tomorrow or for the next week or so, but Josh has got the helm. So keep it right here on Yahoo Finance.